Welcome in to the Tuesday edition of True Crime Tuesday. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. I have my co-host in early today. Ladies and gentlemen, he's the one, the only, the BCB, the big cuddly bear, Beer City Bruiser. Bruiser, how you doing today? I'm doing good, Cruiser. I've been uh, tossing around the idea. I think I'm starting OnlyFans. Are you? I think so. Yeah? Get some of that extra cash coming in. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to put on it. You have no idea what you're going to put on just, no picture, just pictures of different fans from around the world. I was thinking about that, or I was thinking of any of the beer cans that I drink oh, when they're empty. Yeah. Yeah. I take a picture. Right. So it would uh, technically be only cans. Oh, only cans on only fans. Yeah, right. and now that'll, that'll actually like fool people because they'll think, "Oh, cans, okay," and then it's like, "No, it's actual cans. It's not boobs. It's <laughs> yeah." Well, I get it. Yeah, I got yeah. you. Yeah, so right. I don't know. I've been tossing the idea around. Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, don't say tossing around when you're talking about only fans. <laughs> I have to clear it with Mrs. Bruiser first. Sure. I Well, I don't blame you. I, I think you should, too. Uh, getting into what we were going to do for today's show, we we had a guest lined up for today. We really yeah. did. We were going to talk about Bad Henry today, The the uh, talking about the Taco Bell Strangler. Uh, unfortunately, our guest had an emergency dental appointment. Uh, oh, and it's good. kind of hard to talk about your product when you, uh, you got a mouthful of bad twofers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we, we're, we're improvising a little bit today. We're going to do a little rip from the headlines, and we're also going to do Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals today. So, Which uh, is fine, because there's a lot going on in the headlines. Yeah, there is. There's a lot of stuff going on. We're going we're gonna to talk about one main headline that's been uh, in the news and has been quite controversial, and then we'll, we'll go a little off script and talk about the things that you don't necessarily see but are in your local headlines which are quite disturbing and then we'll of course dumb crime stupid criminals we've got some interesting stuff there as well but i do want to tell you real quick about uh uh about ron's book uh i want you to, i want to encourage you because it is coming out it is out now and and i want to get you over there to uh, take a, a look at it um and by all means, pick it up. I, I got the pleasure of reading it over the weekend. Um, the name of the book is Bad Henry, The Murderous Rampage of the Taco Bell Strangler. And it deals with uh, Henry Lewis Wallace, who was in your neck of the woods over in North oh, Carolina. Yeah. I'm very familiar with this because when I moved here, the first thing I did was looked up Charlotte serial killers. And he's number one on the list. There's another not as known serial killer, but he he's the number one because of who he killed, how he killed, and how he was caught. Yeah, he, he was uh, preying on lower economic class black women between 17 and 35 years old. He yeah. knew the majority of these women. Yep. Uh, but, they were either his sister's friends or his co-workers. Yeah. Or, and, and it's funny because they, they call him the Taco Bell Strangler, but I think his first victim actually worked at there's a restaurant around here called Bojangles. Yes. Yep. And I believe that's where they the reason they call him the Taco Bell Stranglers because that's how they put the connection between always oh, killing his employees. Yes, he was but a I manager. I think it started yep. when he was yeah he was a manager, mm -hmm. but I think it started with Bojangles. Um, and because it's funny whenever I his girlfriend I go worked and, at Bojangles. Yeah. Yep. So mm -hmm. whenever I go into a Bojangles and stuff, I'm like, how bad do you guys feel? <laughs> oh God! Oh no! <laughs> but it's it's a very interesting case, and and hopefully he does the the, the book does the case justice because it's yes. yeah, it's a heavy case too because he wasn't a, he was a younger man doing it too. Yeah, he was. He was. Uh, Ron Shepsuk is uh, yep. is our is our was is going to be our guest in two weeks. Uh, we'll we'll talk extensively about Henry Lewis Wallace and and yeah, very good book, very good book, and details in in length about everything having to do with this case. Um, and I tell you, if if you love true crime, you're gonna love this book. It's everything down to his background to mannerisms to how he went about uh killing these women to the the backgrounds of the different women um does it cover how the charlotte police department took a lot of flack for yes this? it does yeah yeah and how maligned the the charlotte police department was what they did yeah. to clean up their act uh and even how 
once they cleaned up their act. And he talks about the dynamic, too, of how the city was growing. Yes. And how they and, they, and they weren't staffing enough detectives. Right, right. When the city grows, crime obviously grows. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a very interesting book. It was a very interesting read. Uh, I was enthralled with it. I really, really did enjoy it. So uh, Ron will be on in two weeks. We'll talk about Bad Henry, the murderous rampage of the Taco Bell Strangler. I want you to go out and pick up the book. Uh, and uh, you know what? We'll put a link to it in the description of today's show so you can you can uh, kind of read ahead. We'll, we'll have like a little book club session with Ron when, in two weeks. So, And it's, a, it's like I said, it's a, a very great case. Like, mm-hmm. If you love true crime, this has it all. This has the how could they not catch him on this? How could he kill this person? He, this person was related to who? This per, He knew this person how? And then when he does get caught, I mean, like, it has everything yeah. that a true crime nut needs. Yeah, and read the book to find out how the, they didn't connect him. And it's so obvious. It's so it blatant. Is. But but you'll find out how the Charlotte Police Department couldn't connect things at the time. Yep. And it's such a it's such an obvious disconnect. But it, it uh, man, you, you'll just want to slam your head against the wall when you see why they didn't connect these things. Yeah, they definitely have egg on their face to this day. That's still a black eye on, and, on the, the detective. And, and you know what? I get it. They are understaffed. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to spoil anything. I don't know what's in the book, but there's evidence where you're like, come on, you guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if somebody yeah. would have taken 10 minutes yeah. to look at this evidence, we could have had them. <laughs> well, not only that, but the FBI at one point said, well, if he's a serial killer, he's not a very good one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it was like, whoa, come on, you know? It, it, yep. Yeah, so Bad Henry, the murderous rampage of the Taco Bell Strangler. We'll have a link in the description of this program. I want you to, to read up on it before we have Ron on the program. So, yeah, it's a very good, very good book. So I encourage you to go out there and, and read it before we, we have Ron on. So so you can kind of follow along a little bit. Uh Today, in today's uh, rip from the headlines, Bruiser, we have some very interesting stories. I'm going to warn you, there's some there's some graphic stories today as well. Okay. Uh, it, so if you're if you're triggered easily, today is not your show. <laughs> today is definitely not your show. Uh, I want to start off today with the Carly Russell case. You might have heard about this. Uh, she reported that she'd been kidnapped. Yes. And then. All of a sudden, things are kind of, it's that that little boulder that starts rolling downhill, and all of a sudden, it snowballs, and we've got, we've got things rolling out of control. Well, didn't it start? She saw a child on the road. Yes. So she called 911, and then the, or called her friend or whatever, and then she went to go help the child, and then a van pulled up and kidnapped her, and, mm-hmm. and, and. Now it's basically blowing up in her face. <laughs> oh, yeah. Blowing up is, I think, a pretty small metaphor here. Yeah. Yeah. We go to Hoover, Alabama, where the 25-year-old nursing student who reported a wandering toddler on the highway, like Bruiser said, and went missing for two days, faces charges after it was revealed that the abduction was a hoax. In a July 28th press conference, Hoover Chief of Police Nicholas Durzes Uh, said detectives obtained warrants for Carly Russell's arrest on two misdemeanor charges of false reporting to law enforcement authorities and falsely reporting an incident. Russell reportedly surrendered and was later released on $2,000 bond. Derzes said Russell could spend up to a year in jail for each charge and pay a fine of up to $6,000 if convicted. Now, I'll stop right here, Bruiser, and ask you this question. Now, you have somebody who's never been in trouble with the law before. They get caught in a little white lie. Is it really worth all that much? I, I don't know. I think, I think they're pursuing it because it caught so much national media attention because she used a child. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. especially with Sound of Freedom coming out and, and child trafficking, like the major thing in the headlines. Yeah. She throws this out there, so everyone right away goes, oh, this must be a child that's being trafficked. Yeah. And then she goes missing, so it's all, you know, so I think she did it at the wrong point. And I, you should never do it, for one. But Right, right. I think her her lining it up the way she did, mm-hmm. it, it was like a perfect storm because the headlines were all about 
traffic, human trafficking. Sure. And this comes up, you know what I mean? Sure. Um, I know she's been fired from her job because of this. I know her boyfriend has left her because of this. Like her life is spinning out of control all because of this little way, all because she needed two days off. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Well, and you have to wonder why she needed the time off too. I mean, you know. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's but probably it, some, some things afoot that are a little shady. Put it that way. Yeah, yeah. And she should have read the room. Like I said, when when the headlines are nothing but human trafficking, child trafficking, don't call the – I mean, you shouldn't call the police anyways with a false report. Yeah. But if you are, don't do it as a child, <laughs> you know, and then you get abducted because that – Right, right. That works right into the narrative that the nation's speaking about. Right. Uh, on July 13th at approximately 9.34 p.m., Carly reported that toddler walking on the side of Interstate 459 and reportedly called a family member who heard screaming as she went to check on the child. Now, police located some of Russell's belongings at the scene but couldn't find her and identified her as a missing person. Uh, investigators also looked into the possible child abduction, but no one else reported it, and there was no evidence to support Russell's claims. On July 15th, police said Russell returned home and told police a man checking on the baby grabbed her, forced her into a car, and the next thing she remembers is being in the trailer of an 18-wheeler. Russell told police she escaped the 18-wheeler but was captured again and blindfolded before the man and a woman brought her to her or to a home. Uh, there they allegedly ordered her to undress, and Russell believed they took photographs of her but didn't recall them having any physical or sexual contact with her. That's the first part of the story that's a little fishy. Yeah. yeah. This reminds me of there was a woman a few years ago that went out for a jog, quote-unquote, and was kidnapped, quote-unquote. Mm -hmm. And so the whole nation was looking for her. And she later gets found. She's got bruises on her. She's got burn marks on her. She's trying to say it was Hispanic people that took her and all this. But as they, they interview her and they, they find more and more, it turns out she was lying. Mm -hmm. She actually was having an affair on her husband and was trying to get away from her husband. So she set up this whole hoax. So I'm wondering if this girl had heard this whole story, realized how much trouble she was in. Yeah. And kind of use the same because if you if you compare the two stories, they're almost exactly the same. They're I very, mean, they're very. There's similar. no eighteen wheeler in the one woman's story, but there is the sexual assault and and all that, you know. Well, if the and if the pictures come out, then she's got an excuse. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, detectives investigated Russell's search history and reportedly saw that she looked up the cost of an Amber Alert, how to steal money from a register without being caught. The, the Birmingham bus station and a one-way ticket to Nashville in the movie Taken. <laughs> well, that, well, she want Liam Neeson to be involved in this? Huh? I guess. I, uh, yeah. In a uh, July 24th press conference, Durs is, uh, read a statement from Russell's attorney on her behalf, admitting the kidnapping didn't happen and that she did not see a toddler walking on the side of the highway. In a statement, Durs is, said Russell's decisions that night created panic and alarm for the citizens of our city and even across the nation as concern grew that a kidnapper was on the loose using a small child. Attorney General Steve Marshall added, we don't see this as a victimless crime. There were significant hours spent, resources expended as a result of this investigation. And not only that, but the many men and women who wore those yellow vests on a hot afternoon and evening looking for someone they thought was abducted. Uh, Marshall said his office plans to fully prosecute the case. Well, okay, I, I get that. Um, I think they're just trying to make an example of her. Yeah, yeah, I get that too. I get that as well. And to, uh, I guess, hammer home the point that, you know, anybody else who thinks about using law enforcement as an excuse for maybe a dalliance or two in the future is going to get the same treatment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that as well. Hold on to your uh, hold on to your seats, folks. This next story is is one that's going to make you cringe, and I mean that quite literally. Uh, this one was sent to us uh, by one of our listeners, and and I got to say thanks for the heads up because this this story is uh, yeah. Um, although I'm not going to put this in a dumb crime, stupid criminals, although it is quite dumb. <laughs> um, this is just plain creepy. 
Okay. And this could have gone on Supernatural News as well. I'm going to read it today. I may read it tomorrow, too. A man allegedly killed a woman and then lived with the body for months in case she came back from the dead. <laughs> Like, oops, I made a mistake. Hopefully it corrects itself. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I only know of one guy who did that, and I think we crowned him a savior. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. We go to Las Vegas where police arrested a 31-year-old man this week who allegedly killed his female roommate and kept her body in a closet for two months. Something tells me there might be a little something wrong with this guy. Just why would you, If you think she's coming back, why put her in a closet? Like, her first image when she comes back from the dead is his, like, sport coat? Like, come on, man. Like <laughs> Dirty underwear and sweatshirts, I guess. Exactly. I don't, you know, I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's comforting in there. I have no idea. <laughs> that's, that was her favorite place in the house, maybe. There might have been a, a vent in there that's climate controlled. Uh, no idea. <laughs> According to a news release from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department on Wednesday, July 26th at around 2.27 p.m., officers responded to a home on the block of uh, Railroad River Avenue. I'll say it's 5300 block in reference to a possible deceased woman. A family member called 911 to report that, yes, the man's name is George Bone. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he had told... Her Beverly Ma was her name was in the closet and had been there for two months. Oh, geez. Ooh. That had to stink. Well, like I said, unless there's some sort of ventilation system in there that's really, really good. Yeah. I mean, it had to be really good. You think he yelled at her at any time? Like, come on, come back from the dead. You're starting to smell. <laughs> yeah, you can come out at any time. You're starting to turn into soup. Come on. Oh, oh. <laughs> Bone soup in the closet. Oh. Uh, police reportedly found Ma's body and said she appeared to have been deceased for an extended period of time. You know what that means. She just flaked away right there in the closet. Yeah. Yeah. They went to go pick her up and it was goo. Especially with, well, I, she probably flaked away because Las Vegas is dry and arid. That's true. Yeah. I didn't yeah. think about it. I didn't factor in the weather. She yeah. Be, she became leather goods or flaky. One or the other. Yeah. Yeah. She was essentially mummified. Yep. Yep. But, oh, the stink had to be amazing. Oh. Especially in that heat. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Ma and Bone allegedly met in high school and became friends and moved in with each other last year. According to KLAS, a witness told authorities she saw a very high air conditioning bill. So she went into the home on Wednesday, July 26th, and Bone showed her the body. <laughs> Oh, hey, your, uh, your bill's really high. Yeah, come here. Let me show you why. I got to make it like a meat locker in here. Yeah, yeah. I got to keep her preserved. She'll Ooh. be back any day. She, she, her soul ran out to get cigarettes. She'll be back. <laughs> her soul ran out for <laughs> cigarettes. I asked her to pick up a bottle of whiskey too, but evidently the soul can't pick up that much weight. <laughs> Police told KLAS the witness noticed a cooler against the bedroom closet door and the bottom of the door had a towel which covered the gap oh, that's, oh that's so he's still, trying to hide the smell yeah bone reportedly told her that she can open it and see oh oh no 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 that's a big red flag right there i'd be like so your dead roommates in there yeah okay i'm good no we're, i'll, we're, I'll be right good. outside on my phone calling somebody yeah 911 hello let me <laughs> let me call a few people to come open it and see i don't think i can open that door it looks pretty heavy <laughs> uh in an interview with police bone reportedly disclosed that ma died in may on May 4th, KLAS reports that Ma called 911 to report a man and a woman screaming at each other, but when officers arrived and knocked on the door, no one answered. Investigators reportedly believe Bone strangled her that day, but the Clark County Coroner's Office will confirm Ma's cause and manner of death. Here's my question, though. Uh, Is she so... Um, what's the word I'm looking for here, Bruiser? Is she so... Uh, I don't want to say mummified, but is she so... Uh, words is hard right now, Bruiser. Um, <laughs> is she so... What's the word I'm looking for, Bruiser? Is she... Uh, corpsified? <laughs> corpsified? Is she so... Mummified? Uh, not, dehydrated? 
beef jerky. Dehydrated is one of the conditions, but has she, uh, you know, uh, de... De... Oh, God, I can't say the word. Uh, you know, but has she... Has her, has her body... Gotten rid of all the fluids? Yeah, is it is it to the point where you can't figure out if she's been strangled? Well, if you're strangled, your hyoid bone, which is in your throat, it, every time some that's how they can tell strangulations from just skeletons. Okay, yeah. is your little hyoid bone actually breaks when you're strangled? Okay, whether it be manual strangulation, rope strangulation, whatever. So depending on her body. You know what I mean? They'll right. at least be able to cut that her neck open and see if that's still intact. And if it's not, okay, she was strangled. But they might not say he used a belt to strangle her. He used rope to strangle her. Or he just uses hands, you know. Because they, it, from reading the Taco Bell Strangler book, uh, Bat Henry, they talk about the different ways you can, you can tell post-mortem that someone's yep. been strangled. One of them is the obvious breaking of blood vessels in the eyes and in the in the throat and yep. i mean but that's post-mortem even a few days after right this has been since may and that dry arid condition you know i mean i yeah. gotta, i gotta think that even with the air conditioning on which brings some humidity into it that body is probably pretty dry Probably. And like I said, if he if he strangled her around the throat, he didn't smother her, they're going to see that hyoid bone is, is damaged. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, if he smothered her, then depending on how her nose condition is, I know when people smother you like they cover your nose and your mouth, your septum usually breaks because it's ah. a lot of force you got to put on. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah. It's not like the movies where you strangle somebody and uh, 30 seconds later, they're dead. Like it's a process. Right. Like you, you go back and listen to some like John Wayne Gacy or some of the famous serial killers that you strangle, like Ted Bundy and all that. They said they were shocked at how long it actually takes and you they'd get tired. But that's why they they were in good physical shape is because they needed that extra strength to to strangle their victims. True. True. Uh, according to KLAS, after Ma's death, Bone ordered multiple items through the victim's Amazon account. <laughs> I guess he needed stuff. Uh, police. That'll show she's alive. Yeah, that's true. Police asked Bone why he didn't call for help, and Bone reportedly said he was afraid of going back to jail for being found with a dead body. Okay. That makes Not sense. Not afraid that he killed her? No. no just <laughs> afraid of being found with a dead body. I'm waiting for the drugs to get involved. You know there was drugs involved. Well, let's see. KLAS reports that Bone told police he put a cooler next to the closet where Ma's body was in case Beverly rose from the dead like the movie The Grudge. <laughs> put her favorite beer in the cooler. Uh, <laughs> she that's... wakes up. Instead of coming back to kill him, she craps open, cracks open a brewski and goes, thanks, man. That's Thank right. you. Thank, thanks for keeping a cold one for me. Uh, police arrested Bone and booked him into the Clark County Detention Center on a charge of open murder and failing to register as a sex offender. I guess that one was in there, too. Okay. Got to cover your bases. In 2012, KLAS reports that a student came forward and said Bone had inappropriately touched her. Yes, I read that sentence correctly. Uh, when she was 11 years old, while they were living together. Henderson police arrested him on charges of sexual assault and lewdness in connection with the allegations. The next year, Bone entered a plea deal on a charge of attempted lewdness with a child under the age of 14. So there you wow. go. Wow. So he's a pedophile on top of it. Yeah. Respectable human being, huh? Like I said, I, I'm, so, I'm shocked that there was no meth involved. Well, there might have been some drugs involved, but it's... Drugs it's, or alcohol, yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure there was. I'm sure there was. Uh, another story that came from one of our listeners. Again, we appreciate the uh, the stories and the fact that you guys are on top of this stuff. Uh, California man charged with murdering a woman and posting video of her death on Facebook. Now that's a new twist. Yeah. According to San Mateo police, the suspect knew the victim, but the motive for her death is still under investigation. The California man was arrested after police say he fatally stabbed a woman and posted... A video of her dying on Facebook. Oh, I heard something like this. There was a guy he did on Facebook Live. He murdered his girlfriend. Yeah. 
According to a release issued by the San Mateo Police Department on Thursday, they were alerted by the Nye County Sheriff's Office in Nevada on Wednesday about a report of face on Facebook of someone who witnessed a stabbing and were provided the name and phone number of the person who posted the video. Due to the seriousness of the crime, Nye County pinged the phone number associated to the Facebook account, and it came back to the area of the 200 block of 37th Avenue, a large apartment complex in San Mateo, according to the release. Given the variance of the ping accuracy and the fact that the SMPD did not have an apartment number, officers went door to door in the complex to find the suspect. What did they do? Is knock on the door? Hey, can we see your Facebook? I have. I, we'll, we'll get there, <laughs> I guess. I guess, yeah. Uh, after almost three hours of systematically searching, officers established a possible connection and located a descendant, or des- uh, not a descendant, a decedent is what it's, it is. I have, to, I have to remember this from when we had uh, Barbara Butcher on. It's a decedent in, the, uh, in an apartment in the same complex. Uh, they identified the suspect as Mark Merchikoff and two hours later arrested him without incident in San Jose, California. Why did it take two hours? Well, I suppose they had to be thorough. True. According to the release, the suspect knew the victim, and while the motive for stabbing the victim is still under investigation, we do know Merchikov mercilessly filmed the last moments of the victim's life, and posted the video to Facebook, then fled the area. This was according to the release. Associated Press reported that prosecutors have identified the victim as Clarabelle Estrella, and that the San Mateo County District Attorney's Office charged Merchikoff on Friday with one count of murder with enhancements for inflicting great bodily injury with a knife. District Attorney Stephen Wagstaff said in an, in, in an emailed statement to AP that Merchikoff appeared in court but did not enter a plea with his arraignment or and his arraignment was postponed for a week as he awaits his court-appointed attorney. Wagstaff added that the extent of Merchikoff and Estrella's relationship was unclear and that the victim was discovered inside one of the apartments of the pinged complex close to three hours after her death. The district attorney also told AP that an SMPD pinged Merchikoff cell phone and his Facebook page in the video have since been taken down. Yeah, but if it's up there, there's people screen grabs and stuff. Because the, the one case oh, that sure. I'm familiar with, when the, the it was a, a boyfriend and girlfriend, and she was breaking up with him or leaving him. So he went over and he, he stabbed her, and he filmed it, and he posted it up. He's either Facebook Live or Instagram. And um, he's smiling. Why is he smiling? Because he's a psycho. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the kid put it up there, and then... Um, he ended up killing himself before he get arrested and stuff. But like the mother went out of her way because people were sharing the death video on Reddit and stuff like that and, and Instagram. And, and so like she would click to see what was going on with the case. And, and she'd just constantly be flooded with the video of her daughter dying. And it's oh like, my God. there's got, you know, so she's, I know she's right now, I think trying to enact a law. Where if you share it or something, you can be prosecuted also. But you know how that that's going to take forever. Yeah. Especially with social media. It's so new. Yeah. You know, hopefully this guy goes away for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And and that nobody, you know, nobody wants to see that. You know what I mean? Especially family and loved ones. Right. Well, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Let's move on. Police identify a suspect in a 1984 Minnesota homicide case using DNA from a cup. (laughs) It's amazing what you can do now with DNA. They caught the uh, the Jersey Shore killer uh, through DNA. Um, He was eating pizza. Yeah. And they got it off the pizza. Yeah. They, They haven't prosecuted him yet, but they just arrested him. They got the suspect. They think it was. It's amazing. Amazing. Isn't it? Yeah. Police have arrested a 66-year-old former security counselor in connection with the 1984 stabbing death of a 33-year-old man. According to a news release from the Minneapolis Police Department, in the early hours of July 17, 1984, 
Officers learned an unidentified intruder got into a fight with Robert Miller and killed him in his apartment. When officers arrived, they encountered two women running out of the building, including one who had sustained a cut on her face. The other woman escaped unharmed. The women reportedly told police the intruder broke into the apartment and attacked them with a knife. According to a complaint obtained by the Duluth News Tribune, the officials found the victim surrounded by blood with fatal stab wounds to his face, head, chest, back, and shoulders. And knees and toes, knees and toes. I added that last part. Uh, Police reportedly noticed the kitchen door was open with a trail of blood and investigators determined the suspect had cut himself with the knife on his way out. Uh, The Duluth News Tribune reports the investigators collected blood from various parts of the apartment, including the floor, back exit hallway, and the back door handle. Despite their efforts, police said they were unable to identify and locate a suspect at the time, and the case went cold. Minneapolis police worked with the FBI's Cold Case Task Force and the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension Forensics Lab to identify a possible suspect. According to the Duluth News Tribune, the BCA created a DNA profile using blood at the scene in 2018. Investigators, with the help of a genealogist, identified Matthew Brown as a possible suspect, and in March of 2023, they took a DNA sample from a disposable cup that Brown had used and found it matched DNA from the crime scene. Okay, so they got him. They got him. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. (laughs) Uh, Police said homicide investigators and the FBI agents interviewed Brown last month while he was living in Illinois. Officials then arrested him, uh, and he was extradited to Minnesota and booked into the Hennepin County Jail on charges of second-degree murder and first-degree burglary. From May of 2006 until July of 2018, Brown reportedly worked for the Minnesota Sex Offender Program as a security counselor. Oh, jeez. How do you like them apples? They like being involved. He's not necessarily a serial killer. We don't know the circumstances around it, but they like getting involved. In a statement, police said even though this week marks 39 years since the crime occurred... Perseverance and collaboration brought a resolution to this unsolved crime. This allows MPD's homicide investigators to move on to the next one. Which brings up the question here, Bruiser. Do you believe this man actually moved on with his life? And was this one time a mistake? Or should he really, you know, I'm not going to say should he be prosecuted for it because he should. Yes. But do you believe he moved on and made good on his life from there, or was he covering up and trying to make good for something he did in the past? You know what I'm saying? Did he, yeah. did he sincerely move forward with his life and do good? Or was he hiding the entire time? I see. I don't know. Um, he needs to be prosecuted. That's for sure. Cause he took a life, but yes. Yeah. Did guilt drive him to change? You know what I mean? Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, he obviously doesn't have a long criminal record. Otherwise, he would have listed off all the stuff he was arrested for between now and you know now and then. Right. And he obviously meant to do good if he was doing security counsel for the uh, sex offenders, you know. Yeah. So, but was that guilt driving him to do good, or was that he was in a bad place when he robbed these people and murdered the guy? Was it? We don't know his side of the story yet. You know what I mean? Yeah. It could it could have been self defense. He was trying to rob him. The guy came at him. You know, and they struggled, and then he stabbed him. I don't know. Either way, he should face a, a jury. You know, and yeah, say his case. Let the prosecution say their case, and if he's guilty, he's guilty. I know this much. Um, my late. Step- I know he needs to pay for his crime. How yeah, about that? yeah, he does. He needs to pay for his crime. I know my late yeah. stepdad paid for his crimes when he was after he'd done his time. You know, he came here to Minnesota and got clean, right? And then turned his attention to being a good, a good citizen, and turning his life around. And he did in the in the last part of his life. You know, last half of his life. And this guy maybe has, and maybe when they they. You know that he's booked and stuff. Maybe he makes the trial real easy. Maybe he says, "You know what? I did that. I, 
extremely sorry. I'm extremely guilty. If you notice over the last 46 years, I've been, or 40, whatever years, 39 years, I've been doing good. I've been trying, you know, I'm willing to take whatever sentence you give me, but this was a turning point in my life. You know, Mm -hmm. he, he might come out and say that, or he might come out and say, no, it wasn't me. I was never there. You know, well, it's hard to say that if you've got DNA evidence. Yeah, they got says, DNA, oh, so you're nailed. That's what I'm just saying. Like, maybe if he's still a piece of shit, you know, yeah. he, he's going to say, no, it wasn't me. I wasn't there. But we have DNA. Like, you were there. Yeah. As a judge, if he if he fesses up and says, yeah, you got me, my DNA was there, I'm, I, I was there, this is what happened, do you go lighter on him? Uh, I wouldn't go... I wouldn't go maximum sentence, but I wouldn't go minimum. I'd go right in the middle. Okay. It's fair. You know, depending on how he is as a person is how I would say. If I could sit down and talk talk to him and see what he truly means, you know. That's the guy right okay. there. See, and he's older too, so. Yeah, he's 66. You know, uh, does it say how, what he's facing second degree charge murder? I don't know. That's not a life sentence. You know what I mean? That's. Even a 20-year sentence, though, to that guy could be a death sentence because he's so old. Yes, it could be. Yeah. But it, you got to look at it this way, too. He lived all that time on the outside. Exactly. So maybe he does go to jail for a while, you know, yeah. for the rest of his life. Yeah. He got to live his life free and clear while another person died. Didn't get to live their life at all. And we're not factoring in that he's got to explain to his family. Yeah. Why he's arrested. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, because yeah. it's not like that's something that comes up, you know, at family reunions is, oh, hey, in 84, <laughs> I murdered somebody. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I off somebody in 84. I just didn't you know. People forget it. that, like, when you get like a killer or a serial killer, they, they always know about the victim's families because the victim's families are, are really affected. But yeah. on the flip side, the, the killer's families are affected, too. You know, right. like the I, it, it's just because it's in the headlines, the the Long Island serial killer that they just they, they got a suspect. Finally, he has three kids. One of them's a special needs child. Yeah. You know, he's married and he, they supposedly said he was doing all the murders where they were on family vacations like they now have to deal with that. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So is well, that enough of a penance for him as he has to come clean to his family? No, no, no. I mean, like, yes, he sure serves jail time, but do you factor in that also while you're sentencing him? Yeah, no, no, I, I, I see what you're saying there. I see what you're saying there. Uh, let's move on. Miami Dade's police chief shot himself, state official <laughs> says, and he survived. But you're not supposed to do that. No, 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 no. It's an interesting story. Let's go to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, of course. The <laughs> Florida, the state where nothing makes sense. Uh, The director of Miami-Dade Police Department was in critical but stable condition following surgery in a Tampa area hospital a day after shooting himself, state law enforcement officials said on Monday. So this is more than just shooting himself in the foot, pulling the gun out of the holster. (laughs) Oh, yes. It's a a tangled web we're weaving here, my friend. 52-year-old Alfredo Freddy Ramirez was in Tampa for a law enforcement conference. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement, or FDLE, is investigating the shooting with the Florida Highway Patrol. FDLE Commissioner Mark Glass said during a news conference on Monday afternoon that Tampa police had responded to a domestic dispute between Ramirez and his wife earlier Sunday at the hotel where the conference was being held. Ramirez left the hotel and suffered a self-inflicted gunshot wound after pulling over on Interstate 75 south of Tampa. This never goes well. No. Uh, Law enforcement is demanding and a stressful career and occupation, Glass said. And Director Ramirez has dedicated nearly 30 years of his life to public service and keeping the citizens of Miami-Dade safe. Today is a tragic day in Florida, was his quote. Ramirez is a 27-year Miami-Dade police veteran and was leading the largest law enforcement agency in the southeastern U.S., In May, he announced his intention to seek election for the newly created role of sheriff in 2024, signaling his desire to remain the leading law enforcement official. A spokeswoman for Miami-Dade County Mayor Daniela Levine Cava told the Associated Press that the mayor traveled to Tampa after the shooting to support Director Ramirez and his family. 
Later Monday, she said in a memo to county commissions that the deputy director, Stephanie Daniels, would be filling in as interim director of the Miami-Dade Police Department. A Tampa police report said officers were called to the downtown Marriott Waterside regarding reports of a man pointing a gun at himself outside the hotel during an argument with a woman. There was no evidence of a crime or immediate danger. The Tampa police report concluded Ramirez was told he was free to leave. Our hearts are with Director Ramirez and his family, said Tampa Police Chief Lee Burka in a statement urging police officers who are struggling to seek help. Uh, Help for first responders and others include the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay and the U.S. Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, which accepts calls and text messages at 988. I do want to remind everybody, too, if if you're having some issues out there, you're, if, you're, if you're having a tough time with life right now and you feel like you want to harm yourself, the first call you should make is to 988. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've had a few people reach out to me recently that are having a tough time in life and, and feel like they've wanted to, to harm themselves. And I'm glad that they reached out to me. I really am. Yeah. And uh, the one of the first places I've I've sent them to is to is to call nine eight eight. It it works nationwide. So. Yeah, and it, if you're struggling mentally, there's people out there. You might feel like there's nobody, but there is. Yeah. And the best thing about nine eight eight is they're professionals. They know how to speak to you. They're they t- they they won't make you feel. Like doing it is a wrong thing, you know what I mean? Right. Will they make all your problems go away? No, but they'll they'll walk you through, they'll talk you through, so that you don't harm yourself because you are cared for. There are people that care about you, whether you see it or not. It's true, and and you just sometimes be re- reminded of that, yeah. you know. Yeah. And and since the pandemic, mental health has come to the forefront. I I struggle with depression on a daily basis. I know a couple of my friends do, mm-hmm. and. Talking to people is is a way to get through it. We're all in this together. Yeah, and you know, in chat this weekend, um, I, I won't mention any names, but there was a lady who was going through a really tough time, and I, I had cited something, and I, I fully believe in this. It's, it's that um, we all need human contact. Yes, we need we all need human contact on a daily basis, and human contact equals love. It really mm-hmm. does. I, and even if it's just a simple hello, if it's a, if it's a smile, if it's if it's just talking to somebody at the grocery store or or a bodega or wherever it is that you are, just a simple hi, how you doing? It, it human contact is love. We all feel love in one way or another, but it's letting us know. It's acknowledging existence. It's a, it's letting each other know that we're somebody, you know, mm-hmm. and it's when we're alone and isolated that the devil tells us lies. That's the best way to put it, that we hear lies about ourselves, whether it's in our heads, whether it's in our hearts, we hear lies. And those lies lead to bad things. So the best thing you can do when you're feeling lonely is just to get out, get out and experience life. Talk to anybody, just just get out and, and go to the store, get out and and just be amongst people mm-hmm. and and talk to people because that connection with people will help you feel the connection within yourself. Best 100%. Thing to do. Yes. Best, best thing to do. Tell you what, we're going to take yeah. a break right here. When we come back, uh, we have a story about a Maryland woman, a sad story about a Maryland woman who ended up losing her life over 10 bucks. Oh no. Yeah. That, that sad story. Indeed. Uh, we have a we have a romantic tangling that we'll talk about and a not so romantic tangling we'll talk about that happens in your old neck of the woods bruiser it's ripped from the headlines along with dumb crime stupid criminals today on the best in true crime podcasting this is true crime tuesday welcome back to a special edition of true crime tuesday i'm the cruiser that's a bruiser and uh, we are coming at you, coming at you, with uh, rip from the headlines and dumb crimes and stupid criminals today. Uh, this story kind of sad, not kind of sad, very sad, Bruiser. You know, you hear about stuff all the time. You hear about muggings. You hear about robberies. You hear about you know 
simple people just wanting a few bucks. I mean, just borrow it, you know, for reach out to somebody. Yeah. I, I've, I admit I've had to borrow from people, you yeah. know, we, yeah. we're not, there's times you just low in your life and financially it's just not working and, but you got bills to pay. Right. Right. A uh, Maryland woman wanted for allegedly killing her roommate, out there during a fight over 10 bucks 10 oh. bucks a woman lost her life for 10 bucks and another woman's probably going to jail for a very long time over 10 bucks we go to prince george's county maryland where police issued a warrant for a 21 year old woman for allegedly stabbing her roommate at a restaurant during an argument over suspected stolen money <sighs> it's just i get sad. you get heated because it's stolen but what what makes you think pulling a knife and stabbing him is going to solve that solution? You know, solve that problem. It's not. Not a thing. It's just going to create more problems. Right. Right. According to a statement on the afternoon of July 8th, uh, officers from the Seat Pleasant and Prince George's County Police Department responded to a stabbing call at a restaurant on the 5900 block of Martin Luther King Jr. Highway. Uh, when they arrived, they found 62-year-old Mervyn Daniel injured. Medics transported him to a nearby hospital where he was pronounced dead. The Prince George's County Police Department said Daniel lived in the same home as the suspect, Rika Poston, and 37-year-old Jesse Cully. Investigators identified Poston and Cully as the two people involved in the stabbing. Police arrested Cully this week on a charge of accessory after the fact and have issued a warrant for Poston's arrest for first-degree murder and other related charges. The statement says Daniel was stabbed during a dispute. According to court documents cited by NBC Washington, Poston and Cully began arguing with Daniel at the restaurant where Daniel worked. She and Cully reportedly left the restaurant but came back and she fought with him over $10 she said was missing. Then she allegedly said in the restaurant, I will kill everybody in this store. Over 10 bucks. Over 10 bucks. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, Poston reportedly stabbed Daniel with a bread knife. Oh, that had to hurt. Oh, ouch. Yeah. Those aren't sharp. No. And she and Cully ran through a back door. Officials found Daniel's body in the bathroom. That's sad. That's very sad. Over 10 bucks. Yeah. Uh, this next story has to do with lovers spurned. Uh, oh, okay. A man is accused of killing a Texas lawyer he was romantically involved with. Probably the last person in the world you should get involved <laughs> with is your lawyer. Uh, we go to Saginaw, Texas, Bruiser, where police arrested a 32-year-old man this week on suspicion of killing a 46-year-old woman and telling authorities she shot herself. Oh, okay. <laughs> the old, you know, there's tests they do to figure out if they did that. <laughs> yeah, that's not the that's not the most uh, ingenious way of telling somebody they, they off themselves. On Monday, July 24th at approximately 10 p.m., the Saginaw Police Department uh, responded to a home on the 200 block of Lottie Lane to a report of a woman with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. At the scene, officers discovered Kimberly Knapp on the bed with a gunshot wound to her upper chest. I see problems with this already. Got you too, but that's how uh, Kevin Von Eric died. Or not Kevin, um, Carrie. He took a gun and he put it against his chest and pulled the trigger. So it's possible. Possible, but not probable. Unlikely, yeah. Yeah. A very painful way to go too. Yeah. Yeah. Officers attempting life-saving measures by applying pressure to the wound before MedStar personnel rushed Knapp to John Peter Smith Hospital via ambulance where she died from her injuries. According to police, 32-year-old Rance Magby, which sounds like a really bad romance novel name. <laughs> He's got the long flowing hair like Fabio. <laughs> Who looks at a baby and goes, I shall name him Rance. <laughs> uh, was also in, in the home... Uh, KDFW-TV reports that Magby, who was romantically involved with Knapp, called police to report the gunshot wound and suggested Knapp had killed herself. However, upon further investigation, police identified Magby as the primary suspect in Knapp's shooting death. Police arrested Magby on a charge of murder and booked him into the Tarrant County Jail. Knapp reportedly worked as a defense attorney in Tarrant County, 
and earned her law degree from Baylor University. Hmm. Well, good for her. Yeah. Didn't know she'd find love defending people, huh? <laughs> now, this guy looks like a Rance Magby. Look at this chode. I can't it, believe I used the word she chode, was, but... She was with him, huh? Yep. Yeah. He he must be packing something downstairs, man, because right. she's way out of his league. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, she's... A, what's with the puppy dog eyes he's got in there with the mugshot? Like, oh, look at me. I'm so innocent. I know, right? No, I know. He definitely outkicked his coverage there, didn't he? Oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 Rant Magby. What an asshole. <laughs> That's all I got to say. <laughs> he just looks like an asshole. He does, doesn't he? Looks like a great ish magma. I, I have so many, so many <laughs> descriptive words for this guy. He just, I, I mean, if any woman, I don't know, she, he, he, you're right. He had to be packing. Yeah. At least 12. What, uh, why else? You know? Yeah. At least eight to 12, at least. Like, oh, yeah. Like a bad Minnesota s- snowstorm, eight to 12. Yeah. A baby holding an apple. That's right. Yeah. Baby arm holding an apple. Had to be. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. She was way, and, and not only that, but she's a professional. You know, she's making good money if she's a def- defense lawyer. Well, that's why a 32 year old man is going after a 46 year old. I mean, I, I won't cast aspersions <laughs> here, but. Ladies, if, if you're, you know, if you're an, if you're a beautiful 46 year old woman and this 32 year old schmegma is coming up to you, <laughs> there's a reason for it. He needs a cash cow. That's right. He's trying to mine. Not your... that you women are cops. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, that lady was not. She <laughs> thank, was, she was thank, very... you. thank you for clarifying, Bruiser. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I'm just saying she's a gorgeous woman. She really yeah. is. And she does not look 46. No, she doesn't. That's the thing. No. Like she, she could go out, and and she could do well for herself on the dating scene. Yeah, a lot better than this guy. Oh, a lot. Yeah. You know, this guy wasn't paying for dinner. No. No, and he looks it. Yeah. Yeah. He he looks like a, a he he looks like a, a a homeless man that would mow your lawn for four bucks. You know. This guy looks like the biggest station he ever achieved at in life was a dishwasher at Choney's. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, he he graduated high school, and that's about all he did. If he did, I think he did. I think he graduated high school, but he was because if you think about it, a younger version of him, probably ran high school. He was probably a jock. He was probably real popular with everybody. Yes. Yeah. And then high school ends, and he peaked in high school. So now life hits him, and like you said, he's he's a dish, dishwasher at Shoney's. You know, Rance Magby's claim to fame was he was the star shortstop on the high school baseball team. Exactly. That was it. He was the guy that when high school kids show up to a party, he's the guy that graduated four years before but still wears his letter jacket to all the high school parties. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's the guy holding the weed. Exactly. Yep. He's the Matthew McConaughey of of, uh, uh, Dazed and Confused. Yep. He's the guy who scored four touchdowns in that one game. (laughs) Exactly. Yep. yep. And he's got all the local papers hanging up in his his bedroom. That he's in the basement because he still lives with his parents. Yep. You know. Mm-hmm. And then he meets her because he does something. He meets her. He woos her. He's got the big hammer in the pants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She. He's like, you know, I, baby, let's go out to dinner. I'd like to pay, but I left my wallet. You know, my mom took my allowance away. Yep, that's right. She's like, I got it. Don't worry. My mom made me pay rent this month. <laughs> yep. Took all my Shoney's money. And that's probably why you shot her. She probably said, you know what? I'm done paying for everything. Yep. You need to get another job. Yep. You need to get a second job. And you weren't very good at football. That's right. That, <laughs> that, that was the only game you ever scored four touchdowns in. Most of the time. Exactly. You're, most of the time you're getting hit behind the line. You you started because the starter got hurt. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you that sucked. was too much for him. You sucked as a running back. You were barely a shortstop. Yeah. Let's let's revise history here. And then he got all pissed off. Yeah. And, and you they weren't found even his yearbook open with him circling the picture of him on varsity. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and you weren't even that good of a weed dealer. It was ditch weed. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah, and the keg you brought was Mocky's best. Yeah, it wasn't even that great. It was Schlitz. We brought a, oh, brought a keg of Schlitz. Schlitz. <laughs> <laughs> then Rance Magby got all pissed off. 
and shot her. Yeah. And went, oh, nope, she was cleaning the gun herself. She shot herself. That's right. Speaking of people all strung out on Schlitz. <laughs> Or Milwaukee's best. We go to Green Bay, Wisconsin to end to end uh, rip from the headlines today. I think I know where you're going with this. She was just prosecuted. Yes, yes. She was just convicted of killing and dismembering a man after having sex. We're talking about a Wisconsin woman who is only 25 years old. Jury found a 25-year-old woman guilty this week of killing and dismembering a man after they smoked some meth and had some sex. Because Yep, I remember we covered this on Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals. Yes, we and then did. the other day we were watching the news, yeah. and it's national news, obviously. Oh, uh, yeah. And I, I looked at Mrs. Bruiser and go, hey, we covered this. Have you seen the court pictures of her? I have it right here, my friend. She's smiling like you wouldn't believe. There it is. Yep, look how happy she is. She's like, I'm going to jail. She's ecstatic because it's three hots in a cot. That's what. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's she's going to have regular food that she can gum because there's no teeth left after the match. I just could not believe how happy she was through her whole whole trial. Like, why are you so happy? You're going away for life. Do you remember what her name is? No, I don't. I don't. Taylor (laughs) Shabidness? That's right. It's Shabidness. (laughs) Shabidness. As in, it's none of she business <laughs> what she what she does in the bedroom. <laughs> WBAY TV The Bay reports that the jury returned the verdict on Wednesday about thirty minutes. It only took about thirty minutes. Yeah, it didn't. They had all the evidence they needed. Yeah, they <laughs> plus did. she's smiling from ear to ear. <laughs> oh, she just loved what she did. She's so yeah. proud. Yeah. She's like, I, I took care of that business. That's oh, why yeah. I'm the business. That's right. She took care of that business. Uh, they convicted Taylor business of first-degree intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse, and third-degree sexual assault in connection with the February 2022 death of Shad Thyreon. Thyreon. <laughs> Shad Thyreon. That's where she stabbed him, right in the Thyreon. Oh, yeah. And then she yeah. cut it off. Yep. Her trial immediately moved to a second phase to determine her mental state at the time of the killing. I don't think it was good. No. Look no. how happy she is now. She's bad shit crazy, and she's probably medicated now. <laughs> she probably is. Bad shit crazy and probably medicated. That's yeah. the name of our new album, by the way. <laughs> bad shit crazy. Coming out this fall. Oh. <laughs> bad shit crazy and medicated from Cruiser and the Bruiser. And probably medicated. Yes, yes, probably medicated. That's what gives you the dangerous feel to the album. <laughs> yeah, Bad shit crazy, probably medicated. New on Arista Records this fall. And the best is it covers all genres. We got we got metal on there. We got polka. Oh, yeah. We got rap. We got and, gangster rap. And we got the polka metal. Don't forget about yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Some of the we best. We got the electronic R&B because we want to be in the clubs. That's right. Want to be? You got to have a club hit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Some of the most fun I ever had in my life. Drinking beer and watching polka metal at a a roller derby deal over in St. Paul. (laughs) That just sounds like you made that up completely. I know, doesn't it? But 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 it was real. Because I'm from the Midwest, Mm -hmm. because I'm from the Midwest, I 100% believe you, and I can picture what type of venue it was in. (laughs) It was, yeah, it was over, uh, it was uh, Roy Wilkins Auditorium, right over there, adjacent to uh, to the X. Yeah, and, and everyone was, else that's not from the Midwest is like, there's no way. And I'm, I can confirm being from the Midwest, yeah. that is the mm-hmm, thing. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it was it was free beer on the roller derby club. Oh, okay. So they're doing yeah. like kind of like a fundraiser for themselves, huh? Well, no, no, no. They, they, we were guests. Uh, Darkness Radio was guests of the oh, roller okay. derby club. So we uh, we were drinking free surly and we were we were uh, getting blotto and, and watching roller derby. Well, listen to polka metal. Perfect. Well, listen to polka metal. Yeah. <laughs> That one, they were the halftime entertainment. You got, you had to love it. I do. I, I'm, yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, let's get back to the story. Let's <laughs> get back to Shabidness. Shabidness. Getting back to Shabidness. Uh, prior to the trial, Shabidness pleaded not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. You would think that'd be the obvious play here. The Brown County <laughs> judge ordered multiple competency exams. At the second part of the trial, Shabidness's father, Arturo Coronado, who sounds like a big-time drug dealer, but he's not. I was going to say, so wait a minute. She went from having her last name be Coronado to Shabidness? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? 
Uh, that that should be mentally defective as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, reportedly testified that he was worried about his daughter's mental state all the time. That's in quotes, according to WBAY. An expert witness who analyzed Shabiznes's medical history said Shabiznes spent time at an inpatient facility after having suicidal thoughts. During a recent competency hearing, Shabiznes attacked her attorney and fought back against a deputy trying to restrain her. Oh, there's clue number one. According to a criminal complaint shared by Law and Crime on February 23rd of 2022, between 2.30 a.m. and 3 a.m., Thyrion's mother heard a door slam and went downstairs to the basement of her home to see if he was still there. She didn't see her son anywhere, but then she noticed a bucket by the door with a blanket on top of it. When she removed the blanket, she found Thyrion's head. Yeah, he was still there. <laughs> oh, he's there. Well, part of him. Yeah. The criminal complaint says the bucket also contained a male organ. We're not talking about the kind you play, unless you're <laughs> kinky that way, along with a body fluid and two knives. Thank you, Deadpool. Yep. Mm -hmm. Green Bay police arrived and discovered body parts, organs, and knives in bags in a storage tote in the basement. Police also found evidence of drug use and blood. Investigators traced Shabidness to an apartment and she walked outside. The affidavit said she had what appeared to be blood on her hands and sweatshirt. She didn't even shower. She didn't even shower. Well, yeah. well, she thought a good hiding spot was the basement <laughs> yeah. of the house she murdered him in. Yeah. Detectives looked inside Shabiznes's van and found a crock pot box, which was on top of a laundry basket of clothes and located additional human body parts, including legs. Yep. She brought it with her. Mm, she was going to cook. <laughs> I mean, she is from Wisconsin. That's what they do. Yeah. Well, you know, put it in a crock pot and set it for eight hours on low. And then yeah. <laughs> you got you stew. Know, you got Ed Gein and Jeffrey Dahmer as your serial killer mentors. Yeah. <laughs> she business told detective she and Thyreon were smoking meth and she put a chain around his neck while they had sex, which she said was part of the sex act. I don't think I read that part of the Kama Sutra. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm completely left out of that one. Yeah. She then said she went crazy, that's in quotes, and started choking him even more. She said Thyrian would not die and that he just kept <laughs> rebuilding into muscle. What, like a transformer? I was going to say, wait a minute, what? <laughs> like he just kept thrusting harder? No, that was him twitching for life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> After Thyrian died, she played with his body and performed sexual acts on the corpse for approximately two to three hours. Oh, gosh. Oh, she's a winner. Shabidness admitted to dismembering Thyrion's body and leaving his organs and body parts around the basement. She claimed she blacked out during that time. You mean Mama was upstairs not hearing any of this? I was going to say, how did Mom not hear any of this? Oh, or smell the mess. It's just the kids playing downstairs. I think I'll make a hot dish. Yeah. According to the criminal complaint, Shabiznes stated the plan was for her to bring all of the body parts with her, but she got lazy and only ended up putting a <laughs> leg or a foot in the van, and she forgot the head. Uh, this will be good enough. They won't find it. I put a blanket over it. We're good. Typical Midwest girl forgets the head. <laughs> you know what I mean, brother? Oh, I know. Yeah. Note to the ladies out there, never forget the head. <clears throat> Just saying. And that'll do it for Rip from the Headlines. <laughs> and with that, <laughs> with that joke, bruiser, it's time now for Dumb Crimes and Stupid Criminals. It's, it's Crayon News Story Time. <laughs> What happened with this dude, Christ Bearer? I heard he uh, cut his penis off and then jumped off a balcony. Suspect pulls gun from butt, shoots twice at Denver police. What is your emergency? I need help. And what's the problem? I'm too high. You're too high? Yeah. That's right, it's time for that segment you all know and love, the segment where we jump right into it, so to speak. 
<laughs> uh, we don't need to reintroduce the one and only the BCB, the Big Cuddly Bear Beer City Bruiser. Although I just, uh, I just did. So, well, I'm right here. Yeah, you're right here. So I haven't left. Yeah, you haven't, you haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> um, so we'll just jump into this segment here, Bruiser. Um, we we have a couple of interesting stories here. We're going to start it off with plans to kill your significant other and or family members. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I got a few of these stories from listeners this week. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know what you it should, was. probably shouldn't do that. No, but they went awry. We'll just put it that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't go on Yelp for serial killer or Yelp for hitmen like we discussed? No, 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 no. And I think you'd be able to find a decent one on Yelp. Yeah. And you can raid them. Yeah. You can raid them. You, you say this killer, good. This one, not so good. This one, cop. <laughs> you just be able to weed them out the, this one is an interesting story the wife of a former Auburn football player was arrested in an alleged plot to kill him okay you know when well, you probably made a lot of money in Auburn uh, not so much this, <laughs> this guy went a while back to Auburn oh okay, okay yeah yeah the estranged wife of a former Auburn Tigers football player was arrested in relation to an alleged plot to kill him he did well after college in a short stint in the NFL, and I say short and I hold up my fingers. <laughs> Can't see it because it's audio. Um, 36-year-old Lindsey Sh uh, Shriver, Shiver, not Shriver, Shiver, Lindsey Shiver of Georgia. Her alleged lover, Terrence Bethel, who's 28 years old, and 29-year-old Farron Newbold were all charged with her after authorities in the Bahamas discovered WhatsApp messages discussing a potential murder plot targeting Robert Shiver, who's 38 years old, and a former Auburn long snapper. Now, oh, okay, so he's a long snapper. Yeah, when, when you talk about the word success, the words Auburn long snapper never follow. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. No, they don't. Yeah. Everybody else from the Auburn football team, long football careers. The long snapper, not so much. No, no, there's not a lot of want from long snappers. I was a long snapper. Yeah. And how did that long snap and career end up for you, Bruiser? Well, I got scouted for me actually playing offensive tackle. And then they, they're like, wait, you can long snap too? Oh, cool. That's just a plus. And you became the best professional wrestler a long snapper career has ever had. Uh, exactly. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I mean, yeah, it's just it's like John Dorenbaugh, who's now famous as a magician. He was a long snapper for the Philadelphia Eagles. There you go. We only know him as a magician. <laughs> yep, exactly. See? And he had a long career with him. He won a Super Bowl. Yeah, but he's a great magician. He's a, he's a fantastic magician. See? See? I'm just saying. Being a great long snapper is like... Um, being great at filing. <laughs> yes. Everything's done on computers these days. So what is she What is she trying to get out of this? Like, obviously, he's a long snapper. He's not making a ton of money. And you said they caught him in the Bahamas? Like, you're already in the Bahamas. But see, here's the thing. Robert Shiver was good with his money. Ah, uh, uh, okay. So uh, uh, let me explain. So a phone was discovered at Grabber's Bar and Grill. Great name for a bar, by the way, that in the is, Bahamas. That is. Grabber's Bar and Grill. In Great Guana Cay. Well, Baha Bahamian police. It's it's the Bahamas, but it's Bahamian? Bahamian? It's Bahamian. Bahamian. Right. Bahamian. Yep. Yeah. Police were investigating a, suspect, a suspected burglary earlier this month. Uh, authorities have not publicly confirmed whether the phone belonged to Lindsay Shiver, Bethel, or Newbold. Robert and Lindsay Shiver own a house in the Bahamas. This is how good Robert is with his money. Okay. Okay. Got some offshore accounts, I take it. Uh, a little bit. Uh, where she's reported to have met Bethel, who, so they have a house in the Bahamas. She's getting yeah. it on with Bethel, right? Mrs. Bruiser tells me now she's an accountant. She tells me if they're living in the Bahamas, they're hiding money. That's right. And he is. Yeah. He's hiding money. Yeah. Um, so she meets Bethel in the Bahamas. Lindsay does. She forms a romantic relationship with him. Uh, a source with knowledge of the situation told the Thomasville Times Enterprise. Robert Shiver reportedly filed for a divorce 
upon learning that his wife had started an affair with Bethel, at which point the three suspects get together and craft a murder plot. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. Allegedly, yep. Right? The quote here from a police report obtained by the Thomasville Times Enterprise says on July 16th, 2023, at Abaco, while being together, did with a common purpose agree to commit an offense, namely the murder of Richard Shriver, or Shriver. I think it's Roberts, but that's the quote, Richard. They didn't get his name right. Why? Because he was only a long snapper long at snapper. Auburn. <laughs> Even his name was forgettable. <laughs> All three suspects were transported from Guana to Nassau, the Bahamas capital city, and appeared in court but weren't required to enter a plea. They just wanted to see them? I guess like, they, oh, okay. they wanted You're to. You're the three we're prosecuting? Okay, we'll see you later. Yeah, we just wanted to Thanks see who the hell wanted to kill Robert Shriver. <laughs> right. Uh, you wanted they to, couldn't believe that somebody wanted to kill a long snapper. Right. They're like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> you want to kill a who? <laughs> Did you not, you not know the quarterback? Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never got introduced to the quarterback? Why yeah, are you we'll killing even give you the kicker. Why didn't you go after the kicker? <laughs> <laughs> you can kill the kicker. I mean, Lindsay and Robert Shiver met at a fitness class. As in, I'll be fitness in you later. <laughs> Uh, Lindsay and Robert Shiver met at a fitness class while attending Auburn University in 2007 and shared three children together, so he'd be fitness in her three times. <laughs> Definitely uh, didn't tell her that he was a long snapper either. He's like, hey, baby, I'm part of the football team. She's like, you are? What position? He's like, I'm part of the football team. <laughs> That's right. He snowed her three times. Um. <laughs> Lindsay Shiver was a former beauty pageant contestant. This is how successful she was at it. Are you ready for this? Yeah. <laughs> They're a perfect couple. She was named Miss Houston County in 2005. It gets, Good for her. It gets better. She, you can see her at the county fair and the state fair. <laughs> That's right. It gets even better. Are you ready for this? Yeah. This is why she's with the long snapper. She finished second in the National Peanut Festival that same year. <laughs> oh, poor girl. The National Peanut Festival. And she finished second. Second. She wasn't even the best at that. Some, so somewhere, Miss National Peanut Festival is, is <laughs> waving it in her face. Oh, look what I won. Look what I won. <laughs> Get your nuts out of my face. <laughs> I'm going to go home to my long snapper husband. Your husband does what? He's a football player. Never mind. <laughs> he was on the team. <laughs> At least he made the team. <laughs> Robert Shiver was a long snapper for the Tigers from 2006 to 2008 and signed with the Atlanta Falcons as an undrafted free agent in 2009. We don't need him. So not only was he a long snapper, he was a second string long snapper. <laughs> they <laughs> used him to fill the roster. Oh, but Bruiser, there's more. He was cut okay. prior to the beginning of the season. <laughs> How do you screw up that job? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so he was battling it out with somebody else. That's what it is. They, they, they got both of them. Yep. He's a long snapper. Yep. And the other guy just, you know. You could get it 10 more yards than this guy. So that's yep. it. You're cut. We don't need you anymore. He didn't even make the practice squad. And his, his wife consoled him. She's like, that's okay, honey. I, I know what it's like. I took second as Miss Peanut. <laughs> <laughs> I took second in the Nut Festival. <laughs> I even had to wipe some, some, some of it off my chin. <laughs> but don't worry. In a few years, I'm going to kill you for all that money. <laughs> So how in the hell did Robert Shiver make all his money to get yes. the house in the Bahamas? Yeah, well, it's illegal. I can tell you that. He lives in the Bahamas. So Lindsay could stup the Bahamians <laughs> to his death? <laughs> Here's how. The 38-year-old is listed as the executive vice president of Senior Life Insurance Company. Uh, yep. Which is based in Thomasville, Georgia. That's so, how yep. that's how he, he made his money. He, he's hiding money. He's taking people's life insurance and, and he's putting it in an overstore. Yep. There you go. We got it. 
<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. <laughs> and I'll tell you how he sold that insurance. He did not open with, hi, I'm a former <laughs> long snapper. <laughs> you ain't know me. Said, hey, do you want to buy insurance from a former Atlanta Falcon? <laughs> oh, what position did you play? I'm a former Atlanta Falcon. <laughs> no, seriously, what position did you play? You're not listening to me. I'm an Atlanta Falcon. That's right. And he said, here, let me show you exactly how you may know me. Then he'd turn around and bend over. <laughs> <laughs> and if that doesn't impress you, impress you, let me introduce you to my wife. She took second place in a peanut festival. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <sighs> yeah. Well, good for them. Good for them. <laughs> Yeah. At least he's alive and unhurt. Yes. She's going to jail. And she's going to jail. You know, she can win Miss NASA County Jail now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> can you imagine the makeup jail or the makeup job there? <laughs> I've, I've, when we used to wrestle at the state fair in Wisconsin, we got to meet all the, they called them the fairest of the fair. So it was all the county fair girl winners. Yep. And I was just like, oh, hey, you're all from Wisconsin, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you look like you can bench press more than me. <laughs> oh, you're a farmer? Okay, yep, got it. You sure are. <laughs> Hey, you know what would would help a little bit? Take the chaw out of your cheek. (laughs) No, that's how they won. (laughs) They get the chaw. People are like, stop hitting that button. (laughs) I digress. They were beautiful women. They were, at least to their cousin. That's how she won the county. That her family owned the county. <laughs> Six generations. <laughs> oh, I love these fair jokes. It's that time of year too, you know. Yeah, it is. It is. Yep. The smell of. I pig- think the Wisconsin State Fair is getting ready to start. It's right. coming up the first week of August, so. Yep. Smell of pig shit in the air. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Well, we just we are the the North Carolina one down here is not till October. I can't wait to go. I want to yeah. see what their comparison to the fair. <laughs> <laughs> Can I enter? I have more teeth. <laughs> At least they have two eyes and two ears. <laughs> I bet if I entered, I'd win because I do have more teeth than them. Probably, yeah. Well, and you know, your your family tree forks. <laughs> Uh, anywho, I suppose we should get on with this we story. Probably, probably should. Yeah. <laughs> We've insulted a lot of people. <laughs> we have. <laughs> it's fun, though. It is. It's very fun. It's good times. It's good times. We continue with the murder for hire plot. <laughs> if you can't trust your wife, you can certainly trust your family, can't you? Oh, sure. Oh, <laughs> fuck no. <laughs> Unless you're a long snapper. <laughs> And the entire family's out to kill you. <laughs> it's like you made that NFL money. And your clients and <laughs> everybody else. You may know me from this. And then you bend over. <laughs> from jail? No. No, from the Atlanta Falcons, you idiot. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Wasn't that Smith? No, he beat me for the position. You'll never bring that name up again. <laughs> You may know me from this, from the club. <laughs> no, <laughs> from the Atlanta Falcons, idiot. A man is charged in a murder for hire plan targeting family member. Of course. All right, why not? Why not? Uh, we are going right here to Minneapolis, Minnesota. We want to thank again our lovely audience for sending uh, sending this story in. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. A Gray Eagle man is facing a felony charge after, or charge as, plural, plural, after uh, law enforcement discovered his alleged involvement in a murder-for-hire scheme. 38-year-old Robert Charles Thomas Sr. 
very, very illustrious He's name. Very illustrious, yeah. Yeah. Is charged with conspiracy to commit murder after hiring what he thought was a hitman to kill a family member. Now remember, everybody, if you want to kill a family member, you're not talking to an actual hitman. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> like if you could go up to a buddy at the gym and go, hey, I really want to kill my uncle. Hey, I got the perfect hitman for you. It's not really a hitman. Right, right. Nobody yeah. knows a hitman. Nobody does. No, no, <laughs> no. Uh, this according to Todd to County Court Documents. Uh, he reportedly believed that after the family member's death, he would earn a significant amount of money and property. That trick never works. Nope. Officials say another motive for the murder for hire could be because the family member is currently romantically involved with Thomas's wife. <laughs> Uncle Joe, he took my wife. I'm going to take your life. <laughs> According to a complaint, a confidential reliable informant, they call it a CRI, notified law enforcement in late March that Thomas tried to hire a hitman to have a family member killed in the summer of 2021. Thomas they paid do that a lot up there, Tim. Yeah. You guys, you guys yeah, don't just... pick women up at family reunions a lot up there. <laughs> well, that's why the family trees don't <laughs> fork in Northern Minnesota. <laughs> That's why they like, call literally it. this guy went to a family reunion to, yeah. to steal a woman from a family member. That's why it's called the Iron Range because it's, the, 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 it's straight. The family trees are straight as a wrought iron. <laughs> yeah, it's, it does. It has nothing to do with taconite. I, I assure you. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I just no, just, no, no, no. But we had to clarify. Said, yeah. Took his wife. Wait a minute. <laughs> I knew we shouldn't go into that 50 year anniversary for grandma and grandpa. <laughs> grandma and grandpa's was what? Related. <laughs> I thought that just meant they were friendly. Uh, Thomas paid $10,000 for the murder, but the hitman left the residence without shooting the family member. He just figured <laughs> what it was a bad hitman. Yeah, he just figured Zero it was. Zero stars on Yelp. <laughs> Zero stars on Yelp. <laughs> I hired this dude to kill him and never showed, he never did anything. He just showed up. Showed up to hello. The, showed up to had the house, beer, had lunch, and left. Patted everybody on the head, said <laughs> I goodbye. Paid him ten grand to have a sandwich. <laughs> it was a good sandwich. <laughs> That'll stop most hitmen, by the way. Make a really delicious sandwich. <laughs> That's what it was. He was all intent on going to murder the whole family. And she's like, well, we're just about to eat lunch. Would you like one? He's like, yeah. <gasps> Man, oh, this is the best pastrami sandwich I've ever had. Oh, yeah. What kind of sandwich you got, you know? <laughs> That'll stop any Minnesotan from killing you. Nice lunch. <laughs> we got potato salad to go with the, with the sandwich, you know. So if you have a random guy show up at your house, don't feed him peanut butter and jelly. Go with, go with no. the deli meat. <laughs> we, got, uh, we just got home from the store, you know. Was it the loot fish? We were down there at the Cub. We, we picked up a couple of de different de deli meats, and we got the special cheese today. Ah. Uh, yeah. Did you offer them some of that their, uh, pickled herring, too? No. No? No, that's only for the special occasions. Ah. Uh. No, we made them a nice deli sandwich, and, <laughs> and we put her on the uh, whole grain bread. Ah. Uh. Yeah, and we, we put her, uh, we got some of the good uh, cheddar cheese. Oh. Put that on the sandwich. No. And uh, we, we happen to have some of the uh, lettuce, tomato, and onion to put on there. Oh, did you, did you toast it for him there, hey? No, no, no. It, oh. it was a quick lunch. Yeah, uh. yeah. Uh, but we had some old Dutch potato chips. Oh. Yeah, the old Dutch. You got to get local. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so and you said you uh, give him some of that Michelob Golden up there. Oh yeah, yeah I got to get the yeah. Golden. No, actually, we uh, we we did some hams. Oh, <laughs> yeah. some of the hams. The huh? hams, yeah. <laughs> got that solidified it there, hey? Huh? It's the beer refreshing hams. <laughs> and uh, so we gave him some hams. And he he just said, "Ladies and gentlemen, this is this the best meal I've ever had?" He said, "That's that." I'm gonna go on my way. That was a refreshing repast, so <laughs> I'll uh, I'll be on my way, you know. Ah. We said, "Hey, don't forget the ten grand," <laughs> and off he went. And we made you a casserole for the road there. No, it's a hot dish. 
A hot dish. That's right. It's a hot dish. Yeah, it's a hot dish. Yeah. We said, hey, take some of that there tater tot hot dish, you know, <laughs> for the road. It's got extra green beans. <laughs> he, he loved it. Uh, yeah. Uh, tater, or tater tot. Todd, <laughs> tater tot County. Uh, law enforcement and the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension then arranged a meeting between Thomas, the CRI, and an undercover agent posing as an assassin. You know what an assassin is in Minnesota? What's that? It's a guy in flannel and a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the CRI. You know, you know how he was an undercover cop? How's that? He took his flannel off and put the orange blaze on because that's a, it's against the law to not be wearing your orange blaze during gun season. That's well, especially you during deer, deer season. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's the, the it's the flannel in the springtime during yeah. duck season, and then it's the yeah the blaze orange. Yeah, yeah. The blaze orange during deer season. Just depends that's on what, which season it is. That's the guy went. Oh no! Why are you changing? Oh, oh. you're one of them. Their uh, police officers, oh, huh? Oh, we know who you are. You dirty cop. Uh, the CRI introduced. Why am I reading like it now? The CRI introduced Thomas and the agent on April 6th in Colburn's grocery store near Long Prairie. So, yeah, I'll go shoot that 30 point buck for you. Yeah. You ever <laughs> been shopping in a Colburn's? <laughs> no, oh, no, I haven't. <laughs> oh, they got some good produce, good prices too, you know. Oh, yeah. Fresh, fresh, huh? I was in a Colburn's the other day. Good stuff. Uh, according to the complaint, <laughs> Thomas provided the so-called assassin with the family member's vehicle information, places they frequent, and a list of their habits. Yeah, that one, he washes his back with a stick and a rag. <laughs> you see, uh, every Tuesday, she's up there at the VFW playing the euchre. Mm. So you could probably get her up there. Yeah, they like a lot of bingo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thomas said he wanted the family member just gone instead of maimed or injured. Yeah, if you could shoot him between the eyes, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it, buddy. Thanks. Uh, during the course of the hour-long conversation between Thomas and the undercover agent, I can't imagine that anybody from northern Minnesota talks for an hour. I was going to say, what did they cover? So ten thousand, yeah, okay. That Kirk Cousins there, huh? Like, oh, jeez, <laughs> let me tell you, I can't believe anybody likes that jerk. I'll That's what it you. was. Yeah, they settled on the price yeah. and just start going. See, I'll get you in the mood to kill somebody. Let's talk about that Kirk Cousins there. Eh? Oh, oh, I'm all ramped up now. <laughs> You know, that, the officer actually went and killed the person. <laughs> yeah. Oh shit! That's right. I'm a cop. <laughs> I'm a cop. Damn it. I wasn't supposed to kill anybody, but that Kirk Cousins, you know, oh, he gets me all riled up. Oh, gee, ah, oh, jeez, you know. Now I'm all full of piss and vinegar. Oh, I haven't been that pissed off since. The since. chief comes up, why'd you kill them there? You're, you're a cop. We were talking about the Kirk Cousins. Well, good for you. You kill everybody, man. <laughs> I, w I haven't been this pissed off since the North Stars lost the Stanley Cup, you know. <laughs> Just saying. Um, where was I? <laughs> now you got me all riled up. God, you know, I had a conversation uh, on on the old Instagram messages with a with a listener too. He's like, "Boy, you know, you're just like you are in the show about Kirk Cousins. You get pissed <laughs> off." It's like you're goddamn right, I do. I hate that guy. Is it, everyone's telling yeah, me. I, I get encouraging messages to keep getting you riled up because it's one of the best parts of the show. He's like, you got to watch this quarterback series. I'm like, for what? So I can hate him even more? <laughs> the piece of shit. He's a family man. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's a family man who fails. Oh, I love him. Yeah. Oh, he's so great. His, oh. his wife dresses him. Oh, his wife dresses him. Cause, why? Because he fails at that, too? No, no, like seriously, like his wife dresses him. That's the big thing I took. They shop at Kohl's and his wife, or they shop at Target and his wife dresses him. Because he fails at that too. <laughs> well, sure. he, he can't, he, he, he checks. He's aiming for his right leg, but his left leg just keeps going. <laughs> That's in. right. He aims for his right leg, but he, throw, he throws his leg over the pant leg and to the left. He tries to put on his shirt, and all of a sudden it's around his waist. Like, what is going on That's here? right, because he can't aim for shit. 
His wife is there to cover him. I get it. Just like Justin Jefferson. Okay. Right. Yes. I got it. Yeah. If it weren't for the fact that he had such talented you wide receivers. You guys, you, you guys he, got rid of Thielen? Yeah, you have him down there in Carolina. Yeah, I was actually, like, I looked at the wife. I'm like, this this might be a decent team this year. Like, yeah, yeah, you're going to have a great <laughs> team. Yeah. But we got, did you hear? We got us a, a rookie wide receiver that uh, drives his car just as fast as he runs. <laughs> Kirk Cousins will still miss him. He will. He'll throw he'll <laughs> throw wide left and, and above him. So you know what? He better learn how to jump too. <laughs> well, he might bail jump. Oh, see, I see what you did there. <laughs> Speaking of bail jumping, I never did finish the story. No, we gotta we gotta finish the story about this youper that wants to uh He's not a youper, he's not in Michigan. Oh no, oh yeah, he's I'm sorry, he's in northern Minnesota. I think it's but the accent's the same though, you know? Yeah, you know, <laughs> during the course of the hour long conversation, during which they probably talked about Kirk cousins, I'm sure for 45 minutes of it, uh, between Thomas and the undercover agent payment for the murder for hire scheme was discussed. Thomas agreed to pay $50,000 for the murder. Holy shnikes. Wow. But in installments <laughs> because he's in Minnesota. <laughs> so, 10000 up front, and then we're going to do layaway, like at the old Kmart down on Lake Street. Okay, Can I spread this over uh, 36 months there, hey? Huh? <laughs> Installment payment. So if I put ten grand down and I do $20 a month, can you do that? I, I thought you could. Um, His checking account, he just puts MFH <laughs> in the memo. <laughs> <laughs> uh since the last murder for hire left him in bad financial shape. So he wanted to do it. Wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> 10,000 was a little rich for his blood. So, yeah. We're going to. The last. He got taken for a ride by a hitman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was true. The hitman actually went and left. So he had to find a new hitman. Yeah. I thought. I thought he was like just talking about this cop. <laughs> no, no, I'll do 50K. But, you know, if we could. You know, because I got Viking season tickets, and they're already fucking me hard. So, so, so there you go, listeners. Um, if you're trying to hire a hitman, he agrees to a payment plan. <laughs> yeah. Probably not a hitman. <laughs> no, no. Uh, the undercover agent told Thomas he could have the Easter weekend to change his mind and call off the murder. Second clue that he's yep. not. Yeah. By the way, um, I'll kill him, but take Jesus's holiday to think about it. <laughs> OK, so while he's busy rising from the dead, you might want to think about not making another one dead. Yeah. Just saying. Uh, the Todd County Sheriff's Office placed Thomas under arrest on Monday, April 10th for conspiracy to commit murder. By the way, Je Jesus is risen and you're in the in the clink. <laughs> yeah. Thomas is expected back in court on May 1st at 3 p.m. I think this is an old story. That's probably. an old story. But yeah. yeah. Still yeah. pretty good. Still pretty good, though. Thanks for sending that along to the listener who sent it along. It gave us some laughs. It did. Yeah. I know this one is current. Okay. Because I found this one. Oh, okay. So if you can't trust your, your wife and you can't trust your family, you must be able to trust your friends. Oh, of course. Who else? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> We go to Florida. Oh, of course. Where two women are arrested for fighting at a party and one bites the other's ear off. We pulled a Tyson, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's a hell of a party. That's right. It's a good party at that. The hors d'oeuvres are ears. <laughs> we go to Callaway, Florida, where two women were arrested after deputies say that they got into a fight, which resulted in one of them biting the other's ear off. We call it a holy field. Just saying. Do you think Which, of, they have a Holyfield and Tyson have a marijuana strain out? Yes. Yeah. The edibles and their little ears. Yeah, I know. It's the cutest <laughs> thing ever. Yeah. They should have just took advantage of that, these two ladies. They'd be just fine right now. Exactly. Yeah. WGH, I'm sorry, WJHG, they all jumbled together when you're reading them, on July 4th reported that Bay County Sheriff's Office responded to a call about an assault and battery at a residence on Oloki Street. Uh, deputies say the incident started at a house party thrown by an unsupervised minor 
next door. <laughs> yes. This, is, this goes back to us talking about the Rand guy. This is the type of party he would go to. Yeah. yeah. That Rance guy. Yeah, Rance. That's, that's the kind of party he'd go to. You know, yeah. he's 36 years old, and he'd show up and he'd be like, hey, guys, hey. <laughs> I remember when I used to do this. This is really cool. Hey, I brought, Parents are at home, huh? <laughs> yeah, parents are at home. I brought the weed. <laughs> you want you want some of this ditch weed? Got my slit, schlitz, I got schlitz in the car if you yeah, want some. I got some schlitz. Got some warm warm hams right I, in the trunk. I brought the Bartles and James wine coolers in the <laughs> in the two liter. So you, there's more of it if you want some. Uh, just after midnight, authorities say a fight started at the party involving several men. At some point, 23 year old Macy Regan. Who must be related to Rants. Yeah. Because yeah. Macy, you shouldn't be going to an underage party. Right. Reportedly tried to leave the party and walk to her house next door. Ah, that's convenient. Okay. Yeah. Investigators say that 18-year-old Dixie Styles. I think you uh, you wrestled her at one time in an intergender <laughs> match, didn't you? I did. I did. Yeah. Little the farmer's daughter, Dixie Styles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then confronted Regan and accused her of stealing alcohol and vape pens. <laughs> That's so millennial. It is, hey, it? you're leaving with the white claw and vape pens. Get back here. <laughs> That's all our stash, man. <laughs> We're underage. You can at least go buy it. <laughs> yeah. Regan then allegedly responded by pulling out a nine millimeter handgun from her waistband because <laughs> somebody doesn't know how to fight. I didn't steal this. I bought this. I'm of age. <laughs> to which Styles pushed the firearm away and they started fighting. There you go, Dixie. Put up your Dixie's dukes. like, I ain't scared no Glock. That's right. Get your gat out of here. That's only a nine mil. When yeah. you when you grow up and you got an AK, then we can talk. Uh, officials say at some point during the altercation, Regan bit the top of Styles' ear off. Oh. Ow. That's the top. That's the cartilage. Yeah, that hurts. Yeah. Both women received multiple bruises and lacerations. Styles' ear was unable to be reattached. Oh, so she's walking around like Mick Foley. <laughs> she is. <laughs> Have a nice day. Bang, bang. <laughs> Her days of wearing glasses are over. That's right. Regan was charged with felony battery causing bodily harm. Styles has been charged with battery. The sheriff's office says the investigation is ongoing. Okay, so the minor got away with throwing an underage party with alcohol and vape pens there? I guess so, yeah. The party is, is old news when you start losing ears. Like, the cops like literally had a smorgasbord here like, okay, what happened? Well, you see, my underage neighbor had me go buy him a bunch of white cloth. <laughs> I'm over here partying with them. I decided to leave. This little hussy comes up to me, wants the white that I bought. <laughs> so I pull my gun on her. I pull my gun. <laughs> he pushes it away. So I bite her. And they're like, battery. And the only, they're the only two that get arrested in this situation. Yep. Yep. Keep it. Keep it simple, stupid. That's that's okay. how the cops like to do it. Yep. Keep it simple. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah, you know, it is what it is. We move on from one drunk scenario to another. Okay. A United Airlines pilot is removed from service after showing up drunk to his flight. <laughs> this is your uh, captain speaking. We're, excuse me. Uh, we're about to take off. It's going to be a four hour and four. What? No, I'm not drunk. No, I mean. Four hour and ten minute flight to uh, Atlanta and uh, or in Atlanta. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can't <laughs> wait to hear this. <laughs> this one, I think, was an overseas job. Uh, United Airlines says it is cooperating with French authorities on this deal. Of all the places to be drunk, <laughs> right? In France. He liked that wine. He liked that wine. Oh, uh -uh, we don't care. Get on board. <laughs> Fly wherever you want. French media, that's a horrible French accent. French media reported that the pilot identified as 63-year-old Henri W. Henri. Uh -huh. Received a six-month-long suspended prison sentence and was fined 
Whoa. Yeah. They're serious over there. <laughs> I think so. In addition to having his license suspended for a year, Le Parisien reported Wednesday that the pilot had a blood, a blood alcohol concentration of more than three times the legal limit set by the Federal <laughs> Aviation Administration. He literally just left the bar to go fly a plane. <laughs> yeah. I did a flight. I'll be right back. <laughs> The FAA said violations of its drug and alcohol testing regulation include those who used alcohol while on duty, those who used alcohol eight hours prior to duty for pilots, those who used alcohol within eight hours following an accident, and an alcohol test resulting in a concentration of how much, Bruiser? I'm going to quiz you here. Uh, well, it's 0.08 is the legal limit, so I'm going to say 0.04. Nice! Yeah. 0.04 or greater for an nice. airline ply, a pilot. <laughs> for an airline pilot, brother. It's a bad paradise pilot, brother. That's right, 0.04. So he was a 0.12, right? If that's three times? No. Yeah, yeah three yeah, times three would times, be 0.12. Yeah. Yeah. So he was drunk. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah he, was, he was tipsy. Uh, the safety of our customers and crew is always our top priority. We hold all our employees to the highest standards and have a strict no-tolerance policy for alcohol. United told Fox Business in an email on Friday. Uh, this employee was immediately removed from service, and we are fully cooperating with local authorities. They went on to say... Uh, United did not confirm specific details of the incident, but a report in the locals that police told the court that the pilot showed obvious signs of drunkenness at Charles de Gaulle <laughs> Airport. How dare you spit on Charles de Gaulle? It's because he showed up without pants. Well, there's that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. I will fly this plane with my wiener. <laughs> Uh, the flight was headed to Washington Dulles Airport. <laughs> oh, so he figured he could silver up on the way over. <laughs> well, yeah. I will put this in autopilot and sleep on the way. <laughs> I guess. You ever uh, you ever seen the Wikiwachi uh, River? The Wikiwachi River, no. Yeah, it's over there in the Tampa area of. No. Uh, by the way, this is the planes, trains, automobiles, and boats section of, our, <laughs> of Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals. Uh, I think this this uh, story is charming. Okay. We go to the Wikiwachi River in the Tampa area of uh, Florida, where a man steals the Wikiwachi dredging boat to travel on the river. <laughs> He, he wanted a romantic drift on the Wikiwachi. He wanted to go nice and slow, catching all the sights. And dredge the fuck out of that river. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure the river, the river is dredged. That's right. A man has been charged with grand theft of the dredging boat at Rogers Park. <laughs> now listen. He's like, sorry I, sorry, I grabbed the wrong boat. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> listen to this, Bruiser. The man's only 35 years old, and he was charged on Friday with the theft of the boat being used to dredge the Wikiwachi River, according to the Hernando County Sheriff's Office. Charles William Fagerstrom, who had no address on paperwork filed with the court, that figures, <laughs> was seen early Wednesday morning by workers who said he was sitting on a bucket on the boat eating potato chips. <laughs> that figures, too. Somehow yeah. it, it's all kind of romantic in a Tom Sawyer kind of way, isn't it? Yeah, he's just chilling out in a nice Florida sun. We, they got some heat down there, mm -hmm. eating his chips, sitting enjoying in the, life. Sitting in the bucket on the boat. Yep. The boat had originally been docked at Rogers Park on Shoreline Boulevard in Wikiwachi. He had not gotten far down the river. Of course not, because he's eating chips. <laughs> he's a go-getter. And he probably doesn't know how to operate a dredge. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a little complicated, yeah. As patrol deputies responded to the area, the workers maintained visual contact with the vessel and prevented Fagerstrom from bringing it back to the dock or to the shore or crashing it anywhere, <laughs> according to the sheriff's office report. If Fagerstrom attempted to flee the scene, he would have been required to jump in the water to do so. Okay. 
Which... Can't do that. There's gators. <laughs> yeah, there's that too. <laughs> when deputies took him into custody, they found the keys to the boat and tools in his pocket, which he had used to pry open several compartments to the boat. Because <laughs> he was looking for, you know, treasure. Yeah, yeah he, was, he was on an adventure. <laughs> He's thinking, hey, it's a dredging boat. Dred you dredge for gold. Yeah, Maybe they keep yeah. their gold here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's just call him old Huck Finn. <laughs> Uh, he was read his rights and admitted that he had tried to steal the boat, but was having difficulty operating it due to parts of the barge equipment being deployed in the water. <laughs> he wouldn't do Oh, shit. I learned that the manual only has everything out of the water. <laughs> it's in the water. Now what do I do? I just don't know how to do it. <laughs> he was only able to travel a very short distance. Fagerstrom went on to say that he planned to use the vessel to travel on the river. Oh, look at Tom oh, Sawyer look here. Look at that. Yep. Yeah. He's like, I just got done reading Huck Finn. Yep. That's all I want to do. Yep. And he knew it was going to be a nice day. Oh. See? Yeah. He was just trying to enjoy the weather. Yep. Fagerstrom was charged with grand theft of a vessel in possession of burglary tools and remained in the Hernando County Detention Center Friday afternoon. How much bail do you think old Huck Finn got for this deal? $1,000. I go a little higher. 2500 One more try. $5,000. Seven grand for old okay, Huck Finn. Okay. By did the he way, at least get a cell with a window? Did he get what? <laughs> a cell with a window? He wants to enjoy the day. <laughs> I think so, yeah. They let him daydream out the window. By the way, this is what old Huck Finn looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Describe to our audience what, he, what he's doing in his booking photo. Well, it looks like he's gazing off in the distance. <laughs> but what I'm thrown by is he's really tan on his forehead. He's really tan on his nose. But his Adam's apple is white as can be. Yeah. yeah. How big is his chin? <laughs> Enough to perch a bird on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what is he looking at? Like, he's literally, it looks like he's just, oh, it was such a beautiful day today. I think he's thinking like, about what like, he would have done if he would have got the boat out of the harbor. He, he is. He's like, I could have enjoyed my lays. Yeah. Just cruising along. I never did finish in potato chips. <laughs> it took my bucket and my chips. <laughs> Doesn't he have that Forrest Gump look to him? Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. I love potato chips. Mama said if I could have got that boat free, we could have gone down the river forever. <laughs> we had ended up in Cuba. I just wanted to enjoy my day. Yeah. Nope. Johnny Law had to come take my chips. He took my chips. He took my boat. He took my bucket. We Not only tan on my nose and my forehead. I was going to go fishing for dinner. I was going to have sushi. What kind of dredge owner leaves a dredge in the water? Don't they know I want to steal it? And I only know how to drive it with everything out of the water. <laughs> Should we go somewhere where they take boating and fishing seriously? Oh, for one like Mississippi, huh? I mean, real seriously. Louisiana? Real seriously. New York. <laughs> I don't know why I threw New York in there. <laughs> New York. <laughs> I'm talking serious as a shooting serious. Okay, where are we going? Montana. <laughs> what? <laughs> they have a lot of boats in Montana, huh? You uh, you hit a you hit somebody else's honey hole in Montana, you're gonna die. <laughs> okay. We go to Lincoln County, Montana, where a homicide and an apparent suicide are investigated. Over a boat launch. <laughs> Two men were found dead near Rexford. It's the prime boat launch, man. If you can't have it, nobody can have it. I think it's the only boat launch in Montana. Isn't <laughs> I it? think so too. Yeah. Uh, law enforcement responded to the Rexford bench boat launch for a report of a shooting at approximately 3.15 p.m. Lincoln County Sheriff Darren Short Short jokes are allowed, by the way. What's up, Darren Short? He's actually 6'10". He is, yeah. Uh, says the incident reportedly began as a verbal argument between two men at the boat ramp. 40-year-old Eric Newman of Bend, Oregon, got back in his vehicle to back down the boat ramp when the other man, identified as 51-year-old Christopher Foster of Kalispell, pulled a handgun and shot Newman. <laughs> 
that's my boat launch. You didn't pay the fee. <laughs> you got to pay the toll. You, you don't pay the toll. I don't get no roll. You can't. You can't back that down there. That's my. That's my ramp. <laughs> Sheriff Short, <laughs> which just sounds funny to say, says yeah. says Foster then went back to the parking area and was later found in his vehicle with an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. Both that's because he realized it wasn't his boat launch. <laughs> right. Right, it wasn't oh, his. Shoot, mine's twenty yards to the left. Oh that's damn it! Right. Now what do I do? That's not my boat. Both men died at the scene. An investigation into the shootings is continuing. The Lincoln County Sheriff's Office, the Eureka Police Department, the U.S. Border Patrol, and the U.S. Forest Service and the Eureka Volunteer Ambulance all responded to the scene. To which they all said, "What the hell is this all about?" <laughs> I got no. to, think- to which they got out went. We have a bolt launch? <laughs> <laughs> Where are we showing up to again? <laughs> There's a body of water in Montana? <laughs> now watch, we're going to get emails. We are. We yeah. are. Like, they're going to send us so many lake pictures. <laughs> it's, <laughs> lake pictures are like porn in Montana. <laughs> Here's a body of water. Here's a body of water. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> Speaking of bodies of water. A quote-unquote Christian woman is busted at a splash park. Are you ready for this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> she, she, she yelling at the bikinis. Oh, it's even better than that. Oh, after, great. After confronting a child, she lied to Ohio cops and is now landed in hot water. <laughs> <laughs> this just gets better and better. A, oh. a self-described Christian woman, a grandmother, that's in quotes, was arrested yesterday at an Ohio... Well, it's more than yesterday. Yeah, it was. Wait, no, no, no. This would be two days ago now. Uh, was arrested at an Ohio water park after witnesses told police she called the child a brat and a fat ass and pushed him <laughs> off a floating toy. Wow, grandma's having a bad day. <laughs> You know, when Jesus was out there walking on the water, he never kicked a kid off a toy and called him a brat and a fat ass. Fat ass. <laughs> yeah. I don't think Jesus ever said called someone a fat ass. No, never did. Never did. Be surprised how tolerant Jesus really was. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He let everybody just float on the lazy river. He never surrounded himself with the children and said, you child over there, you're a brat. And that one, you're a fat ass. <laughs> I give you one of those. Uh, cops responding to a disorderly conduct complaint at the Cedar Point Shores Water Park in Sandusky, Ohio. Again, I've been there. have you been there? I've been there. Again, the Florida of the North. Oh Ohio. yeah, definitely. Oh yeah. for sure. Yeah. Spoke with 32-year-old Jennifer Hutton, who described a confrontation in the kids' pool between her son and a 67-year-old <laughs> Michigan resident. So she went to the kids' pool. She picked this fight. She probably saw that little kid and went, I'm going to get him. Followed him in the kid pool, shoved him, called him a brat and a fat ass. Yep. In a police <laughs> what inter- a good Christian woman. Yes, yes, indeed. In a police interview, the suspect identified herself as Jennifer Lee Miller and provided a cop with her date of birth, home address, and phone number. While admitting that she called the boy a brat, Miller denied swearing at the child and said she did not touch the minor. She stated she was a Christian woman, a grandmother, and she wouldn't do such a thing, the patrolman reported. After witnesses contradicted the woman's claims, a cop warned Miller she would be charged with disorderly conduct if there was another incident. After departing the water park, the cop determined that Miller had provided him with a phony name, that's Miller, (laughs) Miller in quotes, had provided him with a phony name, a fake address, and a phone number that just rang busy. Oh, so they tried the phone number. Yep. I'm guessing this woman doesn't know what a Christian is. (laughs) No. When subsequently confronted about the discrepancies, the woman claimed to not have an ID on her and felt like she was being harassed. (laughs) What? Yeah. Yeah. You lied to the police after assaulting a child. (laughs) You were not being harassed. You're just being a bad person. Right. The woman eventually admitted that her name was Janet Nail. And she was arrested for obstruction, a misdemeanor, and placed in a Sandusky Police Department cruiser. She lied about all of her information and had no reason for doing so, an officer noted. According to her Facebook page, Nail 
has worked at home care. Oh, God, she had to be the most oh, terrible home care worker on the face of the planet. Yeah. Nail lives in Taylor, Michigan, about 100 miles from the water park. <laughs> it's not far enough. I'll show you a picture in a second here, Bruiser. It's, uh, she's, she looks like she is a fine, upstanding citizen. Oh, gosh. Mm-hmm. She's been in a couple fist fights. You think? At your, oh, yeah. she, at your she's local bar? To, she's complained to many managers in her lifetime. Yeah. She looks like she's been road hard and put away wet, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Time yeah. or two. Yeah. She's, she doesn't know what a Christian woman is. She, she's just speaking of with the last guy she slept with, I think. I'm Christian's <laughs> woman. That's who That's I right. am. I'm Christian's I'm, woman. Christian's woman. Yes. Speaking of Owly and not going to put up with a thing, we move on. We are going to Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. The Keystone State. The Keystone State. How do you feel about Dunkin' Donuts? I like their donuts. Mm-hmm. I like they serve bacon. Yes. Just bacon, which is okay. Yeah, I like that too. Uh, it's hit or miss with their coffee. I'm a huge fan of their coffee. I like their coffee. Are you? I'm, it depends. If we, whenever we did pre-tapes, they always brought in Dunkin' Coffee and Donuts. So You know what I love me? I love me a vanilla bean culotta. No, 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 no. No, no That's, culotta. There's a running joke with Mrs. Bruiser and I. So mm-hmm. when we when uh, Ring of Honor used to do Vegas, we always did Sam's Town. Mm-hmm. Now, Sam's Town's way off the strip. It's not on the strip at all. But the cool thing is, is where we wrestled is also attached to the casino, which is attached to the hotel. Mm-hmm. So every morning she would get up, and she knew I like coffee in the morning. So she'd run a Dunkin' Donuts, and she'd pick up the culotta. Ah, uh, yes. And I don't like it, but she went out of her way to go down in the lobby, walk to the Dunkin' Donuts, wait in line, get the, you know what I mean? So I felt yeah. terrible not drinking it. So we were there um, for this. It was four days of shows, and I think we stayed an extra two or three days for, like, vacation. Okay. So we're talking, like, seven days in a row I'm drinking these, you know. So we get home. And she comes home from work one day and hands me a culotte. I said, what's this? She says, uh, well, I passed the Dunkin's. I thought you'd be thirsty. I said, why? There's my, I like, you know, why don't you stop at a Starbucks or McDonald's? She's like, well, I know how much you love these. Like, you drank them every, you know, every day we were in Vegas. <laughs> so I had to let her know I, I only drank them because she went out of her way. Like, I don't like them. Yeah. So now once a year, as a joke, she'll come home with a cool latte. Ah. Just the just the throwback at me, well, and but I thought I was being a good upstanding husband. Well, you know, I thought I was being polite. Yeah, oh, no. <laughs> so it's a little running joke between Mrs. Bruce and I whenever we see a Dunkin' commercial or we pass a Dunkin's. That's what you get for not speaking up. <laughs> <laughs> for being polite, for being a good Christian man. <laughs> there you go. For being a good Christian man. That's right. That's right. Well, this is a bit of a sticky situation. I don't know how you feel about their bagels. I've not I had haven't their, had them. I have not so had their know. bagels. I have not had them. No. But this is a waste of good food. That's what I'll tell you. Uh, a Dunkin' Duo is targeted in a bagel toss. Not the fun kind of bagel toss you can have at home. No, no. This is a little rough. A 72-year-old man threw bagels and a cup of coffee at a pair of Dunkin' Donuts employees at an interstate service plaza, according to Pennsylvania police, who charged the septuagenarian with harassment. <laughs> it, it wasn't what he ordered. 72-year-old man <laughs> chucking stuff around a, a restaurant. Uh, investigators <laughs> allege, he, well, he's got an arm. You know what? The Viking should call him. Oh, no, he missed. Well, it's no better than Kirk Cousins. <laughs> investigators allege that Gurinder Singh tossed... You know, he's probably got a better arm than Cousins. Probably, yeah. If he's 72 and he's chucking it around the restaurant. Probably, because Cousins already throws like he's 72. Yeah, see? (laughs) Uh, Gurinder Singh tossed the items at a 17-year-old boy and a 20-year-old woman working at the Duncan Outlet in the Peter J. Camille Service Plaza on Interstate 176 in Reading. (laughs) What a dick. (laughs) (laughs) 
A Pennsylvania State Police report does not indicate if the workers were struck during the confrontation that occurred around 8 a.m. Monday morning. Even if he missed him, he's still thrown better than Cousins. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, Singh was cited for harassment. The police report states that Singh is a Plainfield, Illinois resident. Well, that explains it. Yeah. Uh, the report does not indicate if any bagels were harmed during the incident. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I wonder if they're everything bagels because that has like shrapnel. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, the poppy seeds and the onions go everywhere, yeah. and the little <laughs> flecks of oats or whatever the yep. crap is they put on the yeah. yeah, yeah. Now that you put it that way, uh, we move on. Here's a bizarre story. Uh, it's not even close to Christmas. No, it's not. No. Well, Christmas in July. Well, we're not in July anymore. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, at the time this story came out, it was July. So it was okay, technically okay. July. Uh, but a Phoenix man gets stuck in a chimney trying to break into his home. <laughs> of all the ways to try and get into your home, the chimney is not the first way I'm going in. No, I'm trying to open a window. You know, I might even have to break a window. Yeah. Something that I can replace. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm not the thinnest guy in the world, but, uh, yeah. you know, even if I were, the chimney's still not. And he lives in Phoenix. What do you need a fireplace for? Right. That's literally Satan's asshole out there. <laughs> Thank you. That, that that gets one of these. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what? Needing... My parents have, my parents live in Arizona and they have a fireplace. Yeah. And I, I asked my dad, I asked Papa Bruiser, I'm like, why do you have a fireplace? He's like, well, your mother lights it up once a year on Christmas. Why? So it can be more hot? Yeah. Yeah. It's 90 degrees at Christmas time. Well, in the morning. Okay, whatever. In the morning when it's what, 85? <laughs> exactly. It's, I'm okay, whatever. <laughs> Jeez. My oh. mom's old. Let her be. That's what my dad says. She's old. Let her be. Okay. All right. Okay. Sure. Uh-huh. Uh, we go to Phoenix where a man was hospitalized early Friday morning after getting stuck in a chimney while trying to enter the home of someone who has a court order against him. According to azfamily.com, on Friday, July 28th, around 1 a.m., the Phoenix Police and Fire Department went to a home near 39th Avenue and Camelback Road because Irvin Gonzalez attempted to enter the residence via the roof. The family who lives in the house reportedly said they know Gonzalez. <laughs> well, yeah. I have a court order against them. <laughs> yeah, we know that asshole hanging from the chimney. <laughs> we don't want him here. <laughs> uh, sure. We're going to slide down and surprise. Hey. <laughs> hey, it's it's unwanted Santa. <laughs> <laughs> I know you may have hard feelings, but I came down the chimney. Everything should be forgiven. <laughs> I don't have any gifts or anything, but. <laughs> except, it's a creative way to get in here. <laughs> except for this restraining order. <laughs> Uh, Phoenix Fire Captain Kim Ragsdale told azfamily.com that firefighters were able to monitor him, monitor the atmosphere around him at all times. Uh, they were able to have contact with him at all times, speak to the gentleman, and provide water for him. Isn't that a little too nice? Well, no, because they lit a fire underneath them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how fast you can go back up. Exactly. You're not stuck. Watch. You'll get out. <laughs> Don't you think if you lit the fire underneath him, or at least, a, you know, put a space heater underneath him, he'd sweat a little, <laughs> that would provide some condensation, and he'd slip right out? He's probably sweating already. That's probably why they're trying <laughs> to get him water. <laughs> He's, he's sweating because he knows he's got a restraining order out. Yeah. Uh, a police spokesperson told the Arizona Republic that Guzman was technically not allowed to be in the residence due to the court order. Well, duh. Is that technically in the residence? <laughs> well, like, yeah. Where does in the residence begin and end I think, <laughs> when it comes to a chimney? I think he's in the domicile the minute he's in the chimney. Okay. Yeah. Technical rescue teams arrived at the home and helped retrieve Guzman from the chimney using a harness and rope. Boy, that's a Chris Angel type escape, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Quick, suck it in. Here you go. <laughs> KPNX TV reports that firefighters had to break a wall from the inside to extricate him. God, can you imagine being the homeowner in this deal? Oh, I'd be pissed. 
Oh, I would. You know he's. You know he's paying for it. That's the minute that you go into the garage, grab the baseball bat, and wait for him to get him out. Yeah. You know, and just start swinging. Uh, Ragsdale said, chimney flues are relatively small and not capable of having a human go in and out of them. You liar. What about Santa Claus? <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the thing. I mean, we, we sit there and talk about, oh, good old St. Nick down the chimney. Do, 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 do. And most <laughs> people buy that shit. I know. <laughs> They've never looked up a chimney before. <laughs> right. Uh, Guzman was transported to a local hospital in stable condition. Once he's discharged, he'll be transported to jail and booked on multiple counts. The idiot. Good. <laughs> Jesus. Stupid ass. Uh, let's see here. We've got four stories and seven years ago left to go in uh, Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals. This 16-year-old took his cue from Jordan Addison and decided to drive around <laughs> at 100 miles an hour. Oh, why not? Yeah, why not? The only 16 ones. Uh, take after your favorite NFL player. Kids, go out there and drive as fast as you can. <laughs> Just saying. I uh, drove around over 100 miles an hour with nine passengers in the car. Jeez, what kind of car was it? I can't wait to hear this. Uh, we go to New Lebanon where state police in New Lebanon have arrested a woman for driving a 2019 Honda Civic. <laughs> That, that wasn't cramped at all. That's pushing it with nine yeah. people in the car. That's literally a clown car. Yep. Uh, on Route 20 in Columbia County while doing over 100 miles per hour with 10 people in the car. That's her and nine others. Luckily, no one was injured, not even the two in the trunk of the small car. <laughs> what, were they playing Mafia, Don? I cannot wait to see the dash cam footage of that where you just see people piling out of this car <laughs> like a clown car. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Uh, the driver was charged with four counts of aggravated driving while intoxicated under oh, of course. under Leandra's law as a felony. She was ticketed re returnable to town court and all the underage occupants, nine juvenile, including four under 16, were turned over to responsible guardians on the deal. <laughs> That's crazy. Like I said, I can't wait for this dash cam footage. That all in New York. New Lebanon, New York. Jesus. Well, and then Jordan Addison said, hold my dog. Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, by the way, if you ever travel to Boston, uh, make sure you say hello to everyone you meet. Okay. I Be usually do. Because if you don't, you're going to get punched in the face. I believe it. I've been to Boston. Oh, my gosh. A Boston man allegedly punched a woman in the face because she didn't say good morning to him. <laughs> you know, if she had opened a door for him and he didn't say anything to her, I'd punch, too. Because if she's going out of her way to open a door for him, at least say thank you. Yeah, well, well, yeah. You know, or oh, good morning. Thank you. You know, that's the only time it's acceptable. Uh, if I'm holding the door open for you, thank me. Acknowledge me. How about that? Okay, Roman. Uh, what is <laughs> where's where's the dividing line here with a punch in the face? Why are you punching anybody in the face for any of this? Well, if I'm going out of my way to hold open the door, you should at least say thank you or, or you know, hey. So if, I can she, see. if she doesn't say thank you, you're going to run in and punch her in the face. I'm not going to, but okay, a Boston person probably will. A Bostonian will punch you in the face if you don't say thank you. Boy, oh boy. Rough city. Yeah. A 33-year-old man was arrested for allegedly punching a woman repeatedly, not just once. You get more than one shot here, kids. It's whack-a-mole with your, with your nasal cavity and fracturing her nose because she did not say good morning to him as he walked by. Okay, that's, no, <laughs> that's too much. I don't want to talk to people while I'm walking. <laughs> According to the Suffolk District Attorney's Office, on July 13th at approximately 9 a.m., Boston police responded to a call on Balsam Street in the city's Dorchester uh, neighborhood, Dorchester, uh, because a woman called to report she had been attacked by an unknown man. The woman said she was watering her lawn when the suspect, Ian Atkinson, allegedly walked by her and then cursed at her for not saying good morning to him. 
Did he say good morning to her? He said, good morning to you. <laughs> and she said, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> he hit her. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> the victim took out her cell phone and began recording him. Atkinson reportedly got into a black Mercedes nearby, then got out and started punching her. <laughs> okay, this is too, this guy's on something. He's a psychopath. Yeah. Security footage reportedly shows Atkinson hitting the victim at least seven times in the head. Oh, jeez. Police said she was bleeding profusely from her nose. Afterwards, he got into his black Mercedes, reversed the car, and swerved toward the victim. She got... Wow. At- yeah. Okay, this is a little extreme. Yeah. She got Atkinson's uh, license plate on camera and provided it to police. Holy whitey bulger, Batman. <laughs> The victim also reportedly noticed Atkinson wore a GPS tracking device. Ah, uh, there it is. Yeah. There it is. Police used the license plate number to locate Atkinson at a home on Lucerne Street and found a second Mercedes registered in his name. Officers concluded Atkinson was allegedly the same person in the video, and the victim pointed him out in a photo lineup. Police obtained a warrant for Atkinson's arrest and took him into custody on charges of assault and battery causing serious bodily injury and assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. According to the district attorney's office, the victim sustained a fractured nose and subconjunctival hemorrhage to her left eye. Okay. She reportedly bit Atkinson's shoulder during the incident. District attorney Kevin Hayden said... It's difficult to comprehend the viciousness and randomness of such an attack. In this case, on a stranger doing nothing more than watering her lawn all over a perceived and perhaps non-existent slight. But it isn't difficult to admire the bravery and alertness of this victim and her presence of mind not only to get crucial video of her attacker, but also notice that he was strapped with a GPS device. Yeah, knowing that he's a criminal. Yeah. Good for her. Yeah, for real. This next story, we're going to go overseas. <laughs> you ever feel like you're surrounded by the clampets there in North Carolina? <laughs> Sometimes, yes. I have a story Dep- for depends you. Depends where we are. I have a story for you that's going to echo those sentiments. We're going to China, where... I can see where sometimes the rural area combines with the big city and it makes you want to back out to the rural area. (laughs) Okay. This is kind of an amusing story. When I saw the story, I thought this is too, too funny to be real. A farmer moves to the big city and tries to raise his cattle on an apartment balcony. (laughs) He's got to raise them somewhere and gets in trouble with police. Well, of course. A Chinese farmer who had recently relocated from his rural home to an urban apartment building in Sichuan province shocked his new neighbors when he started raising seven calves on his balcony. (laughs) Imagine living on the upper floors of an urban residential complex and waking up one morning to the mooing of bovines and the smell of manure. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about about the slats on the balcony when they do manure. It's only going one place. Right, that's right. It's going on. Yeah. It's going on your uh, balcony. Yeah, and on you maybe if you're outside and enjoying your balcony. Exactly. Uh, that was the shocking experience of hundreds of people in Sichuan Province who were shocked to find that a new neighbor had started raising cattle on his small fifth floor apartment balcony. Oh, it's got to drop to four other balconies. <laughs> oh, that's disgusting. Hey, he's just doing what he knows. Yeah, he's a farmer. That's right. The man had recently relocated from a village and had brought seven bovine calves weighing between 10 and 20 kilograms with him to raise his pets. That is not a pet. That's not a pet. Yeah, a cow is not a pet. No. Cow is food. (laughs) That's right. Annoyed by the constant mooing and foul smell of the young bovines, many of the residents called the authorities and the animals were forcefully removed on the first day in their new home. Uh, videos of the calves on the balcony of the apartment building have been doing the rounds on Douyin, or Douyin, which is the Chinese version of TikTok. And while that is... Wait, what? Yeah, I know. I, that's an oxymoron, isn't it? 
Yeah, because don't they own TikTok? Yes, the Chinese own TikTok. And while most reactions have been humorous, some users pointed out that many of the residents of this particular apartment complex spent their whole lives in rural settings, so growing vegetables and raising animals is all they know. People there have spent their life living in the countryside and were used to keeping poultries and uh, planting vegetables in their gardens, in their yards, one person commented. Uh, interestingly, back in January, some residents of the same apartment complex were complaining that many people were raising noisy chickens in their apartments, creating <laughs> discomfort for their neighbors. As for the farmer who brought his young cows with him to the big city, local news outlets report that he has put property management and security guards on high alert as he has repeatedly attempted to sneak the cattle back into his <laughs> fifth floor apartment. They need to put in the lease, no pets. Right? <laughs> crazy. It's just crazy. Um, one last story here on Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals for you today. And this one, uh, fair warning. If okay. you're staging a home, if you're getting ready to sell a home, your realtor isn't as much in it for you as you think <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and beware of the things in your fridge. Take inventory. <laughs> I will. And if you're a realtor and you think, I'll just help myself to something in the fridge, beware that it's going to cost you. Okay. All right. We go to Canada. I know, Bruiser, you, you can't wait to I'm go not, to Canada. Yeah. No, not a big fan. Oh, come on. Don't say that. Our, you know, every time you say that, our, our downloads drop in Canada. <laughs> Canada's great. I know, isn't it? Yay, Canada. I love Canada. I, I personally love Canada. I, I have, you know, relatives that found Quebec. Go Canada. <laughs> Believe it or not, drinking someone else's milk straight from the jug cost a British Columbian real estate agent $20,000. This is a dick move. <laughs> it is. It's a huge dick move. Mike Rose was recorded on home surveillance footage, sipping the milk and putting it back. Oh. You. <laughs> I, I have words with him, but I don't think I'd have $20,000 worth of words with him. <laughs> no. A British Columbia real estate agent has been fined $20,000 after being caught on camera drinking milk straight out of the jug at a home he was showing. Well, there goes your commission. <laughs> yep. Yep. A consent order released by the BC Financial Services Authority last week and or said Mike Rose was alone in the home in Kamloops, British Columbia in July last year as he waited for his clients who were interested in buying the property. Oh, it gets worse. <laughs> it it gets got worse. thirsty. Rose went to the refriger refrigerator to find water, according to the consent order, but instead... Swig some milk straight from the container, which he then put back in the refrigerator. Oh, at least grab a glass, bro. Yeah. The consent order agreed by both the superintendent of real estate and Rose said the owners of the home saw him drinking the milk when they reviewed footage from a surveillance camera, then confronted him about it two days later. He's got to know there's cameras, too. He's showing the house. Right. You know, like, yeah. oh, this is our wonderful house. It's this many square feet. We have security cameras, yada, yada, yada. Feel free to drink some milk. <laughs> Rose, who apologized for his actions, was told he wasn't welcome in the home, and his clients replaced him in their purchase of the property. He claims in the order that his behavior was out of character, and he was unusually dehydrated at the time because Milk's of a new... not going to rehydrate you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, and he was unusually dehydrated at the time because of a new medication, as well as being under considerable stress. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't sell the house. Yeah, true. Milk's not going to help. No. Milk was a bad choice. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, drink their beer. <laughs> no, it's Canadian beer, so. Oh, no. Uh, oh, wait, yeah. Go Canada. Yes, go. Yay, Canada. Yes, thank you. It states Rose opened the fridge looking for water, but when he couldn't find any, he instead drank the milk. Now, he's going to get more than just a slap on the wrist here. The homeowner, Lyska 
Fullerton, I believe it is, said she is still upset by Rose's behavior and is glad the regulatory body did something about the incident. It's just a little bit more than a slap on the wrist, which is good. She said it's definitely a fine that's going to put a little dent in him. Fullerton posted the surveillance footage to Facebook (laughs) after the incident in July of 2022. At the time, she said she notified another real estate agent at Rose's brokerage, Royal LePage Kamloops, who notified management. When you have professionals in your home, you feel like you can trust them, she said. And I learned quite a lesson in this. Uh, Shortly after the incident in July of 2022, Rose wrote in a statement to CBC News that his actions were unfortunate and uncharacteristic. It said he would spend time considering his behavior and take action to prevent any similar missteps in the future. I have never done this kind of thing before, nor will I ever behave in this way again, said the statement. Rose, who is now working at a different brokerage, agreed to pay a disciplinary penalty of $20,000 to the authority for conduct unbecoming and $2,500 in enforcement expenses. And he probably will never sell a house again. I don't know. He's with a different firm, dude. So, you know, I mean... You know, it's going to get out. They're going to be like, that's the milk bandit. The milk bandit. (laughs) He's the one sucking from the teat. That's that guy. (laughs) That's that guy right there. Ah, That's that's like one of those worst nightmares come true, you know? Yeah. Drinking from the carton and putting it back. Ah, No, thank you. No, thank you. (laughs) That'll do it for the program for today. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Bruiser, for, for filling in today for, oh, uh, no problem. for Ron Shep, Shepsuck. No problem. Shepsuck. That's what I'm here for. Yeah. Uh, we'll have him back in two weeks. Two weeks. Um, again, it's a great case he covered. So. Yeah. Yeah. And again, the book is Bad Henry, uh, uh, the, the case of the Taco Bell Strangler. So we'll have a link in the description of this program so that you can pick up the book and uh, follow along with us in two weeks when we have Ron back on the program. Yeah, it's a great case. And it, it's just a it twists and turns galore. If you're a true crime fan, this is a great case. And if you're not and you're interested in true crime, just not sure if you're a fan yet, this will make you a fan. Yeah, most definitely. So we want you to uh, pick up that book and, and follow along with us in two weeks when we have Ron back on the program. Uh, tomorrow on Darkness Radio, Supernatural News. We've got uh, all the all the best and all the weirdest and even funny in Supernatural News tomorrow. Uh, just a bit of a teaser. We've got some interesting AI stories. for tomorrow. Oh, great. Yeah, some nightmare fuel for you. Lots of AI stuff this week. Um, so, yeah, we'll talk about that. Lots of developments in AI. You know... Yesterday, there was a story in the news that uh, Minnesota's own Amy Klobuchar, a uh, congressperson from um, Minnesota here, actually enacted a law ahead of time before they do it nationally about deep fakes. Oh, OK. So, yeah, uh, she got a, 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 uh, a law passed here locally in Minnesota about okay. uh, deep fakes. Nice. So in I think coming up here in August August first, so we're we're already into the into the new law, you can be prosecuted for creating a deep fake in the state of Minnesota. Oh, okay. Well that's um, good. Yeah. Which is ahead of its time, which is a good thing. Uh but lots of AI stories um for um or more AI stories than usual. By the way, people <laughs> our listeners are really on the robot dog thing. <laughs> I know I saw all the pictures in the chat. <laughs> but I mean they're sending me more robot dog stories. I, I mean they are creepy. They're creepy as hell, but yeah, people are all over the robot dog thing. So I get it, folks. They're creepy. <laughs> I get it. But there's only so many robot dog stories we're gonna do. Uh, just saying. Now I'm gonna get more robot dog stories. Yep. But, yes yeah, you are. Yeah, but there's that. So um so tomorrow, supernatural news, and then on Thursday, we're going to tackle the alien debate. The, uh, All right. We're going we're gonna to tackle UFOs, UAPs, and aliens. We're going to talk a little um, 
We're going to talk a little bit about the meetings last week, and we're going to do it with a man who has a book out there, a very interesting book at that. It came out last year, and it's called The Illustrated Guide to the Fermi Paradox. Uh, The Fermi Paradox had everything to do with, if you remember, scientists a while back saying that there was no such thing as other life in in the universe. Right. Why all of a sudden have scientists reversed that Fermi paradox? And why all of a sudden do we now believe in life on other planets? Okay. We'll talk with our guest about that. And we'll, we'll talk about his book, The Illustrated Guide to the Fermi Paradox. And we'll bring up the debate. Why is it now that science believes in life on other planets? Why all of a sudden now do we have these these the government specifically digging into ufos and aliens why the video footage why did people lose their lives over such evidence why now are whistleblowers coming forward and by the way in tomorrow's news uh i've got audio from tmz in which uh representative tim burchett talks about uh lives being lost and why they can't get uh, specific testimony from David Grush about the specific lives that were lost over um, over s- some of this evidence. Okay. So interesting stuff tomorrow on tomorrow's uh, Supernatural News, and then later in the week uh, with our guest. Um, uh, interesting set of programs this week. So very interesting. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to delve a little bit into the alien stuff this week too. And and go a little bit further with that. I know there's, there's quite a few programs that are, that are getting into it. We're going to get into it a little bit as well this week. Um, And working on some other things too, to try and flush out that, that issue. Um, Because I do find it fascinating, but I wanted to go the other side of it this week, instead of getting into the, topic itself let's go the other side of it the fact that science was denying right life on other planets why did they flip it yeah yeah why did we flip to now believing so much in life on other planets so yeah we'll discuss that with our guest on thursday all right so yeah so that's uh, that's what's coming up this week a bruiser let's talk yes sir. Let's, let's talk aml for a second what's going on in aml Training. Uh, in fact, I got to get going here soon. Uh, to train the youth of the future for pro wrestling. AMLWrestling.com if you want to become a wrestler and train with me. Uh, I do Mondays and Wednesdays, and then there's a class on Tuesdays and Thursdays with a different coach. And yeah, that's all I got. Just got done producing a show uh, Sunday. Went really well. Got complimented from Jimmy the Heart. Jimmy Mouth, Mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart which was really ego booster for me. So That's really cool. Really cool. And, of course, uh, if you want to check out AML Wrestling, and please do. It's a great product. Great product. And see what it is that uh, Bruiser's producing. You can do it easily. Go to the Title Match Network and subscribe. Yep. You can subscribe. Yep, it's from, all on there. Yeah, nine ninety nine a month. You can see... Uh, the they they put AML wrestling on pay per view on Title Match Network. I know I'm subscribed and I I watch them on on pay per view and good young talent down there. Yep, the next one's August 27th with another stack card. So yep, there you go. Check and, it out. And it, now Kane is signing autographs down there, right? I think he is doing something in ring, but don't quote me on it. Okay. He will be there. He will be there, and he will appear on camera. But I don't know exactly. I did see an, an article. I know it was it was tweeted out. I'm sorry, X'd out now. It's, it doesn't sound right. Damn you, Elon. Um, uh, it was before it was X'd out. It was tweeted out. Um, on Have you heard of the wrestler named Blue Kane? Yes, yes. Okay. And I'm actually going to ask him about that, see how this guy's able to get away with it. Right. So, okay. So, and, and he doesn't want anything to do with what he calls Red Kane, which is the guy who's coming to your, to uh, AML. Right. So I'm going to ask, I want to ask the original Kane, like, how is he able to get away? How is he getting past the trademark? Right. Because the suit's the same, minus it being red, it's blue. He spells it exactly the same. Yep. You know, so, and that's all trademarked. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And the only thing different is that when he goes to summon fire, it's a snowstorm. 
That's exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm gonna curious to see how they get around the trademark. You yeah. know, if if Kane even knows, which I'm sure he does, but oh, I'm sure he does. I'm yeah. sure he does. So it's it's kind of an interesting deal. I know it's in yeah. baseball, but it's. <laughs> I just uh, I don't, I'm trying to remember how it came up. I, I was I think it. Matt Cardona tweeted out how he wants to wrestle him. Really? Yeah, and then WWE tried to shut down his page, and for some reason they couldn't. That's I'm gonna ask. Yeah. Kane, all these questions. Twi- I'm curious as how. Twitter yeah. wouldn't shut down his page. I did see that in the article. Twitter wouldn't yeah. shut down his page because WWE yeah. wanted it shut down, and they wouldn't do it. Yeah. But so but, I don't know if the trademark ran out on the Kane name or what. But I'm gonna ask. I know he changed his Twitter handle. That's how he avoided being shut down. Okay. Yeah, that's how he avoided being shut down. But it's it's interesting stuff. The the yeah. guy is a little he's a little off his rocker. I don't know. Oh yeah, you got to be to be in wrestling. Yeah. You know, I've never seen him wrestle or anything. I haven't seen any clips. I just I don't really care. No, you know, I, I, I. It's just, like good for you. You're making money off somebody else's name. Way to go. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's it's. I'm like, just curious about the legality, how they get around everything. Right. Right. Yeah, it's a little hokey that you're making your you're living off somebody else's name. There's also yeah. another guy out there. I, I saw it. Um, I know we're talking wrestling, and someone's like, "You don't need to talk too much wrestling." Me, 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 me. <laughs> Just unclench for a minute. Um, there's also an, another guy in the Chicago, Illinois area who's making his name off of uh, Fabulous Freebirds. He's he's. Oh, that was that is a whole debacle. He stole the jacket from. Yeah. Uh, Buddy Roberts Jr. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Miranda Gordy and Buddy Roberts Jr., the actual children of the actual original Freebirds, they're trying to get that all shut down. And there's a, it's a whole fiasco. I, I talked to Miranda about it the other day. And she goes, I, I really don't care if they use the name and all that. That's fine. I just want the jacket back because it was Buddy Roberts' jacket, you know? Yeah. And, and, yeah, it again. I don't get why you're making money off someone else's name that you right. have nothing to do with. I don't care if you met him at a show 400 years ago. Right, right. They they created the name. They made the name. They made it famous. Their kids are now living through you know using that, which they it's their birthright. Right. You know. Well, and they're making Bad Street USA T-shirts. And... Yeah, but they're putting Chicago above it, so that's how right. they get around the trademark. Right, but and but you would. Think but she w, she's WWE been in contact with WWE. Right. Yeah. And they're gonna their lawyers are gonna be on it. Okay. So it won't be around much longer. Good. Good. Yeah. She didn't want to go that route. She didn't. She wanted to handle it amicably. Guy chose not to. So. Yeah. Well, when you're being an ass about it, I mean that's that's the problem. That's what she yeah. said. She goes, if he wasn't an ass, I wouldn't have to do this. But. Yeah. Yeah. And then the show they ran was a complete joke. Yeah. Yeah. None of the wrestlers got paid, and there's only oh. like 30 people, and it was just—it was a whole debacle. Yeah. And, well, and then shut them down. Shut them. Yeah. Down. And I just—I just—I feel bad for Miranda and Buddy Roberts Jr. because yeah. it, it's their legacy, yeah. you know. Yeah. They, exactly. They're trying to, to make the Freebird name live on. Yeah. For their fathers, and their fathers aren't here anymore. Right. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a damn shame. I mean, you can get over on your own. Yeah. Figure, exactly. figure something. Figure something out. You know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's not hard. No, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not. So, so yeah, that's just, uh, that's a little bit of that. So, yeah, amlwrestling.com. Uh, we've got uh, on, also on the events page on darknessradioshow.com uh, links that you can get to AML. Uh, also a link to Title Match Network, so you can check out AML as well. I encourage you to do that. Uh, check out uh, Bruiser's Day Job. So. Yep. And if you go into the archives, you can see me wrestle. There you go. Can't now because I'm not wrestling, but go in the archives. But yeah, you can go in the archives and see uh, see some of uh, Bruiser's matches there because they're they're quite entertaining. So they, yes, they are. So that'll do it for uh, today. Again, join us for Supernatural News tomorrow and Thursday as we will check out the illustrated guide to the Fermi Paradox. And we'll talk about why on God's green earth has science changed their minds about why there's uh, life on other planets. Exactly. We'll check that out on Thursday. So for Beer City Bruiser, I'm Tim Dennis. Thank you so much for joining us today on the best, best in true crime podcasting. This has been True Crime Tuesday.